and um, that was that was tough, wow. right? And uh, all those that are in teaching uh, in higher education, there there is a lot of pride amongst each and every educator. There's a lot of um, uh, ownership, uh, and that sometimes can get in the way of of what we should be doing as educators. And yeah, and the last thing I think that that's important to that is um, it's not about me as an educator. Absolutely. It, yeah, it has nothing to do with me and it's all about those students. Absolutely. It's all about preparing them for the moment that they shake a hand, get a piece of paper and say that they have gotten a quality education. And the last thing that I would I would hate for is for that moment to happen for those students, for them to walk out the door and and you know start looking for work and have people looking at their portfolio and have um and have someone say, Well, you know, thanks for coming by. Your stuff great, but it's not what we're looking for. You know, if if they're you know, they leave and then those those folks doing the interview, this is my this is my worry. This is what keeps me up at night. It's like, man, who taught them? <laughs> the last thing I want is for someone interviewing one of our students to actually go, wow, where did they get their education? In a bad way, right? I want them to say that in a in a very excited way, like, wow, where did you get your education? That's that's beautiful. That's wonderful. Yes, you're exactly what we're looking for. Yes, you have exactly the skills, the tool sets that we need. That's what I'm hoping for. So, yeah, my worry is like, gosh, who, who'd you learn from? Who are you, you know? <laughs> well, in curriculum design, it, what gets missed is the designer skills. And what does not get missed are these fancy titles for courses, you know? And what's really happened in many, in many institutions is that they're not building at the core, but they're building around, but without a strong core. It's very hard. It reminds me of what uh, Michael Johnson uh, said uh, about the, you know, three, four, five, ten amazing ideas in the portfolio that gets immediately somebody hired. So, you know, yeah, yeah. it's really sort of the you know, ideas, but, but also that what gets missing is, 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 the, is the core skills often. Yeah, I, yeah, I completely agree. Um, it, and the harder thing, I think, for, for most universities, too, or most programs is um, one don't try to be everything. Okay. You really have to kind of know who your faculty are. What are your faculty strengths? And with those strengths, what model does that allow you to build? And you have to start looking at the large picture saying after four years, what is our student, right? What can they leave here with? Because they can't leave with everything, right? Um, and then depending on the size of your, your university and the size of your program, that makes it even more difficult. So then you have to break it down to, you know, what our faculty are bringing in the levels, first year, second year, third year, fourth year, and where the students have come from. A lot of our students at this university come here without any design. Some even come without any art background uh, from their high school. So um, it, it's That's really true. important that we start with that foundation, with that core. One of the things that I talk about highly in my uh, level one graphics class is just elements and principles of design, right? They get that in our foundation courses. They get that repeatedly, right? Uh, line, shape, color, value, texture, right? Uh, I ask my, my students in my level one graphic design class at least once a week, if not uh, every other week, um, uh, at the least amount, is uh, tell me your elements of design in order now. And they're like, uh, and I'm like, well, if you can't even think about your composition from the beginning of line in movement, in direction, and what that means, then you know how, how are you going to build a, a compelling composition that speaks to, speaks to someone? And I talk a lot about the psychology of our mind and how important it is to understand those values. Uh, I talk about the Sith Teens Chapel, and I talk about um, the 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 hands of David and God. Oh my gosh! I hope I'm getting it. I hope I'm getting it right. Um, 
and the importance of that choice that was made, of that distance where they're not touching. And it really, it, it, we want to, as viewers, we want to see the connection follow through, right? So it's just at that right point where it's close enough, we want that to happen, but it's far enough apart yet where we kind of understand that emotion and that, that what's happening in that moment, right? So, um, you know, if you can't look at space and that idea of that line connecting and the importance of that um, and the power of that communication, you know, and, and so I keep bringing students back. All right, what are your elements of design? Go, tell me, right? Uh, even when we're critiquing and stuff's on the wall, if I see something that's a little bit off, spacing between two shapes, you know, I'll ask them to, to tell me that. And I'm like, okay, with that in mind, what's wrong? What's, what's missing here? And that's an important thing that's missing from a lot of coursework is instead of the faculty talking, right? Uh, I've been to so many, I have been through so many courses and I've seen so many courses that the faculty talk. I'm a talker. You guys can tell that already. Uh, Lefterius has had very little that he needed to say so far. But that is the toughest thing for me to learn that I had to learn as an educator was to shut up. Basically, I had to close my mouth and actually, instead of the students asking the questions, I'm asking the questions, yeah. right? I give them material, right? I have my presentations. I don't even call them lectures anymore because it just doesn't sound exciting. I either have a, a presentation or a discussion. And, um, but after that, I'm done, right? And, um, and then I start asking the questions. Even when a student asks a question, I'm like, well, what about what if, how can, you know, so they've got to, they've got to process them, process it themselves. And I think that's much more rewarding on a student's end to just go through a class, get straight A's and go, well, that was fun, right? What did they get from that? But when they can have the ownership, when they can dig, when they can um, answer that question themselves, then they've learned, then they've gained. Um, and that's just going to keep going. And, and if we can get them started on that, in that graphics one, graphics two level design courses, um, come their junior and senior upper level classes, they're already in that habit, right? They're already trained, even though they don't know it, to to work those solutions out rather than, you know, the instant gratification. Let me ask somebody else because I don't want to spend the time to think about it, right? So, and that's the biggest change in students today. I think is, uh, you know, can't I push a button and get an answer? And, and the answer is no, you, you can't. Well, since we're on the subject, you know, we are staying in our education uh, and you've seen many, many structures of education in many places. Uh, if you could magically change something or, or, you know, what would you, what would you do? What would you change or remove completely? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. What would I change? I think now that this might be um, hypocritical to say because I'm on the 10 year path and I, I, I want to have, I want to achieve tenure. And I don't know if that's just to benchmark myself to say, I've done it, I've accomplished it, right? I think that's more of what, what I'm searching for out of that is to, is to know that I've completed that. But what I've seen in the past is um, when someone has that security, not just security of tenure, but security in their program, security in their university, security with their dean, um, security with their chair or having an opportunity to be, be a chair or a co-chair or whatever it might be, um, that they for, not, I don't know if it's forget, but it seems to impede why they've become educators in the first place. And I'm not saying this is a blanket statement for all educators, but I do see um, a level of, well, well, I'm a tenured professor. And, um, and I think that's something that really kind of hurts our education. Um, and I think if, if, if people just stuck to, I love teaching, I, I, you know, I don't, the title doesn't matter. I just love teaching, you know, I think that would, that would change a lot. Um, 
I just held a podcast interview myself for Design Dedux with uh, Mitch Goldstein of Rochester Institute of Technology. Mitch is a phenomenal guy. Um, you know, we we both suffer from the imposter syndrome, um, but I think that's important because we both we, we both come to our classrooms with that same uh, that same idea of, you know, I'm lucky to be here. You know, I'm glad to be here. I'm so fortunate to be here, and it's not about me being in this classroom. It's about those students. So sometimes that stature, sometimes that that title. Um, not intentionally, you know, I don't think people intentionally mean to uh, forget about their passion of teaching or forget about the students. Um, but I do, I do think it gets in the way and, and whether it's, it's tenure or seniority or whatever it might be. Um, you know, I, I, I do see that as something, if I could change that, I would change kind of that, um, that model. I don't know what it would be. I have, I, I have no idea what it would be. Then you was put there in order to protect the freedom of expression. So that in order that so, so that so that we could say whatever we wanted, regardless of the implications. And that, right. And that's really the whole purpose of tenure, so that you don't say the wrong thing and suddenly next year you have no hours or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's, right. And that's that yeah. was the purpose. That was the original, the original purpose of tenure. And, and that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the freedom of expression, freedom, well, of, freedom, freedom of, you know. Yeah. That yeah. Can I important aspect? Yeah. Can I um, can I touch on that for a second? I don't know how much time we have. Plenty of time. Um, time the plenty way. of time. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So I'm going to go back and tell you a, um, a, a short story, and I hope that story doesn't ref reflect negatively upon anyone, right? Because uh, I, it's not meant to be, do that. My undergraduate studies was in a university that had a very particular vision on what they were delivering. Now, I talked earlier in the podcast about that. And I think that's great, and I think that's fine. Um, to a degree, and let me let me tell you what I mean about that. So, the university that I was uh, going to was a very modernist Bauhaus style of of I don't even know if it was of education but of an idealist way of design, meaning this is how design's done. Everything else is just not really there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I don't think they came right out and said that design is no good, but it was like, this is the right design. Everything else is everything else, right? Even Black Mountain College graduates? <laughs> yeah. And I noticed in my in my senior year that that's kind of what was happening, right? Because mm -hmm. as a as a younger student, and I was a non traditional student, so I wasn't that young. I was in my um, uh, later twenties. Um, but I said, "Well, wait a minute." So all along here, there's been this is how you do that. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. It, it was teaching, but it was teaching a very specific way of design. And um, that's fine. That's what they chose to do. But it was in my senior year that I was like, wait a minute. Would you look at all this amazing, beautiful design out there? Um, in my undergrads classes, they talked a lot about Massimo Vanelli. Uh, and uh, Massimo was a big impact on our, on our program, for sure. And, um, but boy, in my senior year, I was like, well, look at this guy over here. Stefan Seigmeister, Seigmeister, what, what is his name? What, look at what he's doing. Uh, David Carson, and then Ed Fella. If you look at the work that Ed Fella is doing, that's not Bauhaus or modernism. I don't even know what to call that, but it was amazing, right? James Victoria, and the list goes on and on, right? Of these interesting, amazing designers doing work that's, this is still design. So, man, it, it was in that moment that I was like, gosh, I feel like I was ripped off a little bit here because I was taught how to be this designer down this little tunnel and all this other stuff outside my tunnel wasn't designed. Um, but I, I spent a lot more time looking at that world that's out there and fell in love with it. Um, and I still use inspiration from all of those great designers um, today. 
and and the work that they're that they're creating and doing and who they're ex- inspiring. And that's one thing I brought back into my classroom. The one thing I told myself as an educator, I am not going to create mini me's. I am not going to create mini modernists. I'm not going to create um, that type of designer. My objective is to have the student look into themselves. Um, some of the things that I do in the classroom is I have a weekly journal. Go explore. Go find who these, I give them a list. And I tell them this list is not even an exhausted full list. Look at these people and see what they're doing and see where your passions lie. Find your path. And then I work with them about, um, and one of my biggest pet peeves is those folks that say you have to be able to, to draw to be a designer. And I'm like, you, you have to be able to communicate. You don't need to draw. And I point back to Ed Fella. And I point back to James Victoria. James, if you're listening, Ed, if you're listening, you guys can draw. Trust me. Okay, I'm not saying that you can't draw. But the problem is, is students look at the perception or the idea of drawing and they see like pencil sketches of realism. Right? And I'm like, that's not drawing, though. <laughs> that's a skilled, beautiful rendering for sure. But drawing is, can you make a mark and communicate? So I, I go to the board and I draw the three primary shapes, a circle, a triangle, and a square. And I put the circle on top, the triangle next, and the square at the bottom, and they're all kind of connected sitting on top of each other. And I was like, what is it? Right? And everyone's like, well, it's a girl in a dress. And I was like, I've communicated. My job is done here. And I said, if I want, I can put two lines coming out of the side of the triangle and put two ovals on top of those two lines. And now she's carrying balloons, right? So, and I, so students have this moment of like, their mind, their mind's blown because it's like, well, no one's ever told me that before, you know? And I says, to be a good designer, it's about communication. And you can communicate in the most simplest, uh, with clarity, in minimal stuff that it's amazing. And I think a lot of young designers have that problem of overcoming where they're in a program. They're like, well, I need to be a designer. So they, they take everything they can possibly put into their minds and their bodies about design and try to regurgitate that into whatever they're creating. And it's like, all you had to do was draw a circle, a triangle and a square and it's done. You know? Drawing as evidence of, of observation is something very different. So, so what, what, what students need to be doing is, is not to be drawing in the classical sense that you're saying, but they need mm-hmm. to be observing. And what they're not doing is observing. So there's got to be a, a way of, of, of asking them to observe because there mm-hmm. are many times that even though we are looking at the same piece of work, we're seeing two different pieces of work. So right, right. I, I discovered you know, really early in my teaching career that you know, how do I make them see what is in front of, of them. And, and, and that's the whole challenge. Drawing as evidence observation is very different. And that's yes. yeah. the coordination, something very different. So uh, th- that's what's lacking and for, for a lot. So that's what we need. You know, so yeah. And, that I, and I think that's what builds into um, their creativity, mm-hmm. right? Because if, if, if I did tell them, we'll draw a little girl, right? you know, at what extent would that drawing have taken, right? Versus that simple observation of, well, a circle that looks like somebody's head, a triangle, that does look like a dress. And that square, that can represent some legs, you know? Um, so, so I think you're spot on that, you know, observing what's there, uh, being curious, right? So that observation comes out of curiosity, and if, if someone was to present that to a client, right, and I'm leading to my next point of facing fears. So once you observe, once you're curious enough to kind of understand those things, uh, the other thing that stops a lot, of, a lot of young designers is fear. And they're like, well, they think, they must, they think to themselves, that's, that's stupid. You know, I'm not just going to do that. I'm not going to put a, a red pepper on a uh, chair coaster and call it a poster for a furniture company, 
right? Woody Pirtle's um, famous hot uh, hot chair or hot pepper chair, <laughs> whatever the name of that poster is. Um, because even even Woody Pearl at that moment had to have that like thought of like, gosh, are people going to think that's stupid? No, it's genius. It's brilliant, right? So um, a lot of students get then stopped at fear once they've observed and their curiosity takes them to to an answer. And I had a student once where we were working on logos, um, and, and it was more. And I told them it's more about the conceptual push and the clarity and simplicity than I care about the final logo. Like, I don't care about your final logo. I do, but that's not what I wanted them to learn, right? Uh, and I talk about that in the class. They, they understand that. And he's like, well, it just seems too simple. It seems too easy. And I was like, then you've got it. If it, if it seems too simple and too easy for, for you, don't overwork it. It's there. The answer presented itself, right? You, you were observant enough and curious enough to be like, boom, I got this thing. And you feel guilty because you haven't, air quotes, worked for it, right? And uh, so that that goes back. So many young designers kind of get too involved in, I'm a design student in a design program, and I need to, I need to live to a certain level of expectation as an artist, as a designer, right? Um, and they don't have to do that. Yeah, of, of course, of course. But there's also, remember, that we're also a craft. So like musicians play mm -hmm. their, their scales, yeah? Yes. The craft side of our profession needs to have a skill base, and that skill base needs cultivation. And, that, yes. and, and that's yes. quite hard to communicate these days. So uh, tell us about, about employment and, and the challenges of employ, for employment today. For the, for the graduate. Yeah, yeah, that's something that I don't try to glorify for my students. I don't try to um, <clears throat> tell them that, you know, you're going to be an employable designer when you, when you get out of the program here. Um, they will be, but it's not, it's not that easy. And I kind of talked to them a little bit about, um, pardon me, I talked to them about, um, I guess the odds. So I, 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 I hope that it's a motivating factor for them and not a um, mind-crushing blow uh, for them. But I tell them to think about it this way, okay? There are jobs out there for designers, and there are so many amazing opportunities, whether you're, you're <clears throat> working for an envir environmental agency, which I have a... a a uh, former student <clears throat> doing that. He's a, a marketing manager and he is their creative person in all the aspects there for an environmental agency, you know, or, or you could be doing the top like ads for Nike and Apple at some big design agency firm, everything in between. <clears throat> and there's all kinds of those jobs out there all around the world too. And I tell them if they're ambitious enough and they want to explore the world, this is a career path where they can do that. They can go anywhere in the world. And the voice of design is the voice of design. Whether you're in Spain, central Arkansas, in the United States, New Zealand, Australia, wherever you want to go. I say, here's the problem that you have to think about as an individual in joining this profession. We are at a university where we have a senior class that's going to be graduating. We're a small university. We're a small program. So even in our large number of students, I say, I say large, but it might be um, anywhere from 30 to 50 students. It's not a, not a huge program here, which I'm very glad to be a part of a small program. Um, that's a whole other podcast episode. Talk about that, those opportunities. Um, you know, I tell them those are graduating seniors this year. Okay. In our town, we have five universities. Now, not all five have art programs or design in their program. So that's just locally. So if, if I move to regionally, um, we have one, two, three, four, five large universities, all with large graphic design programs, 
we're a BFA in studio art with an emphasis in graphic design. Mm -hmm. So we don't even have a BFA in graphic design. The other universities that we're competing with within our state all have degrees, right? That's in our state. So let's just say 50 is a round number. Not all of a sudden, if we have, let's go with four, because that's easy math for me, because I got into art because I don't like math. And that's a whole nother discussion. Um, I talk about math all the time in my design classes. Great. So anyhow, that's 200 students that are graduating or that have just graduated this spring in this state alone. And that number is probably low, in my opinion, 200. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six neighboring states. You could maybe go seven. Some of them touch just a little bit. So now if we have six times 200, that's 1,200 students, if I'm doing my math correctly. And those larger programs have more students than 200. So let's just round it up to 1,500 in local states. So let's go nationwide. All of a sudden now, it looks like we're talking about 10, 20,000 students graduating in one spring semester with the ability to go into the graphic design profession or the design profession or something related to it. Um, I don't even want to think of the number if we went globally. Okay. And we have in the United States, plenty of, plenty of graduated student, uh, students that are looking to work in the States. There are many, many designers that come to New York and Los Angeles and Chicago uh, and, and work here and do some amazing work. I know a few of them uh, personally. And um, so now I go to that one student. I'm like, how are you going to be recognized as one of those employable students? So when I have those students that kind of mediocrely work through a project or it, the day it's due, they come in, they're like, can I give it to you tomorrow? I really didn't, I, I really didn't have time to finish it. I said, remember that story that I told you way back in, in that graphics level one class? I said, where are you falling in that, in that statistical line? Yeah, you can hand it to me whenever you feel like it. That's the beauty of college. Do whatever you want to do. That's not my objective is to force you into learning or force you into doing the work. You have to decide right here, right now, where you're falling on that statistical line. Will you continue to work at a local food chain? Will you continue to try to stock the shelves at that retail establishment? Or are you going to land that job for the environmental company or for that agency doing work for Apple or Nike or Mercedes, right? Where do you want to be? And they have to make that decision. I can't I can't make them that designer that is all of a sudden doing the, the, the ads or the marketing or the creative work for Mercedes. Nobody can make them that designer. Absolutely. If it's at the most elite school in the world or at one of the smallest programs in the world, a student can go to any university that is teaching um, art and design and be able to learn depending upon their attitude towards it. And, and that's the biggest thing to overcome. And I hope I answered your question, oh, but it did, it did I mean, go on a, um, a very personal journey for me. Yeah, yeah. But um, employment is possible. Employment is out there. There's even, even in this pandemic, right? Um, there are agencies that are closing. There are agencies that are working less. The agency that where I do the creative direction for, um, they're growing. Mm. They just added... Um, two people to the sales team and they added another person to their video team and um, they need more creatives because as I'm trying to uh, work with the creative direction, you know, I've only got a handful of people to, to do work and there was a project that I needed to hand off and I had to figure out, well, who can take this or do we need another person on board to take this work? Um, and there, and there are those agencies where they're, they're not doing as well. They're not succeeding and they're not, uh, they're not growing. They're losing clients. And uh, we just talked about a couple of clients where they're all of a sudden stopping their um, current contract under their, their current spend, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's definitely affecting that. But um, it's an employable area, employable field. And I, and I, and I think the the pandemic has just changed how we work. Yeah. Um, 
it's a very digital profession to begin with. So uh, I think I think the ability to work remotely, as long as you have the tools, um, we can pretty much work from work from anywhere and and do what our ambitions are from anywhere. I mean, look at our our podcast. We're both from different spots in the world. Um, luckily, we're not like too far apart in time zones where um, you're not up at three a.m. <laughs> so, but yeah, that, yeah, that's my take on it. I can I can. I'll, I'll digress. I can get really involved in that conversation. Oh, you're working on some amazing project. We talked about it last time. So, oh yeah, talk about yeah. your projects. Sure. Um, well, I'm always keeping busy. I've already already said that. I, I just I just have to be creating. And um, I'll can I'm going to be transparent and honest with you. I hate research. I despise research. <laughs> Maybe despise is too powerful of a word, um, but research is a lot of work for me. <laughs> I'm sure it's a lot of work for anyone. Um, but for me, as soon as I, I know I have to read something or have to search and search and search to find the material I want, I'm like, oh, oh, this is going to hurt. All right, here we go. And I get into it. So one of the things I wanted to create was a documentary film. And I did have a, a, a topic in mind. I'll talk about the topic in a minute. But I'm like, yeah, this is going to be a perfect opportunity and a perfect uh, medium to showcase this content I want, uh, this, this documentary film. So, and I still don't consider myself a researcher at heart. So even at my, my research as part of my promotion and tenure work, um, it has a lot more creative endeavor look to it than it does um, pure solid research to it. So I was thinking this documentary film is a, is a great way to keep my creative endeavor going. Uh, it falls right in line with my creative endeavor and my projects. But the amount of research um, that's going into this project has been um, eye-opening. Uh, and, and it's critical. It's important. I can't tell this story without the research. Um, and maybe that's what's held me back because it's been a project I've been thinking about for five years now, I think. And uh I talk to a few colleagues about it all the time. I'm like, yeah, I got this wonderful creative endeavor idea and I, I just want to do it. And everyone's like, wow, that's a great idea. Wow, that's a great idea. And I was like, thanks. Who's going to do all the work? Because um, the documentary film, it's going to take us about two years to complete. What is the title? What is the project? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll fill you on that. So I, I did say us. So I am um, collaborating. I have a, a partner in research, I'll call her. Uh, Amanda Horton. She is the um, design historian, design history educator. Um, I hope I'm getting the, the, the titles at least close. Um, uh, but Mandy is out of the University of Central Oklahoma. So she's in a, a state adjacent uh, to ours. And um, I got introduced to her through Diane Gibbs, which has her own podcast, uh, Design Recharge. And uh, I had an opportunity to uh, visit and give a lecture at the University of South Alabama where Diane teaches. Um, but I got that introduction um, through another colleague who taught at a university prior to me getting to that university. Anyhow, you know, a long backstory. And I was telling Diane about the story too. And she's like, well, well, first with the podcast, he's like, well, just do it. I was like, okay. She goes, just do it. It, it was the most again, back to the simplicity and the clarity of it, you know, I talked to her about my dream of the podcast. Her answer was, just do it. But, okay, I guess you're right. I mean, why, why, what's holding me back? What, what are those fears, right, that are holding me back? Um, so then a further conversation, I talked to her about this documentary film, and she's like, well, just do it. She goes, if nobody else is doing it, and you, and you have the idea, and you, you want to do it, just do it. So I'm, that's why I'm doing it. So anyhow, um, Mandy, Amanda Horton, Mandy, um, I reached out to her through a suggestion from Diane Gibbs to uh, see if she's interested in collaborating on the project with me. So uh, we are doing a documentary film and the documentary film is on women uh, of graphic design in America. And um, there, there's women in graphic design all around the globe throughout some amazing, amazing um, places with outstanding work. 
And one of the things we had to realize was we can't like, it's so big. Right. And, um, the history aspect of it is what kind of got me interested in it because I had, you know, I teach history of graphic design and actually curriculum development. I developed that course for the university I'm at now. So that, and, and as a matter of fact, I did that for Purdue as well. Um, and one of the things that we talk about is the information that's out there, what's in the history books and the history books do talk about women designers um, from Beatrice Ward to the Glasgow girls to polish here um maybe some in between some barbara kruger or something like that right some april greenman um but it just kind of says that these women were out there and these women did design and they did this thing right but it doesn't really talk much in depth about it, it doesn't talk about the journey it doesn't talk about the struggles that they they had to overcome to even be recognized as a woman designer right most women designers uh, we're put in the production room and paste up floors and typesetting. Um, but we know that there are some amazing women designers out there throughout history. But that's not really talked about to its degree of importance in our history books. Here's an interesting caveat. Caveat? Aspect? Irony? I don't know. Um, we are going to be interviewing and talking with Elizabeth Meggs, which is the daughter of Philip Meggs. And uh, her mom, uh, Libby Meggs. And um, Libby Meggs, the wife of Philip Meggs, of the author of, of Graphic Design History, uh, in its sixth edition, knowing you of the seventh edition, Libby was responsible for the Virginia is for Lovers campaign, right? That was one of the US's biggest campaigns in the 70s. I remember as a kid, you know. Virginia's for Lovers and all the commercials and the, and the uh, magazine ads and stuff. It was phenomenal. It was brilliant. Um, but do we hear about who was behind that, right? Do we, do we know that it was Libby Meggs, which is the wife of this amazing graphic design historian that put together this beautiful text that so many of us use as the foundation? Interestingly enough, as uh, Elizabeth asked us to reach out and engage with Sandra Max, Maxa, Max, I think, uh, I'm bad with names, I, I apologize. Uh, but Sandra is going to be writing the seventh edition uh, or editing the seventh, revising, right? So now we have the voice of a, a woman historian in that text. So this documentary film, I just felt it was so critical to be sure that I was looking to a female design historian really? to help me tell this story. Because who, you know, left curious, who am I, right? Who, who am I? So it goes back to maybe the imposter syndrome or it's not about me, right? It's about what I need to tell or what needs to be told, not even what I need to tell. And um, I had, was in a, um, a Zoom meeting with a bunch of design historians and uh, we were asked, Mandy and I were asked to discuss this idea of this documentary film with, with that group. And I had, I, I was challenged. I did have a female design historian, which I think there was only two males, myself and another, another male in that meeting, where one of those um, design historians said, why you? And I, and I, I honestly, I said, you know, I was waiting for the question and I don't really have an answer, but my answer is why not me? And she goes, do you think it's right for, and, and, I'm, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't know exactly how she had posed the question. She goes, do you think it's right for you as a male to be telling the story of female designers? Uh, and I said, I don't know. I don't know if it's right. I said, but it's not, it's not happening. I want to make it happen. So why not me? Right. And um, when I told Mandy that in a previous discussion that Mandy and I had, she's like, yeah, she goes, that's fine with me. She goes, you know, we, the story needs to be told no matter who kind of tells that story. I'm just feeling that, it's a great, I'm so fortunate. This is such an opportunity for me. And I feel honored and privileged that I'm working on that project. This isn't, you know, my project. It's not Mandy's project. It's, it's our project, right? Our as designers, right? And getting that story out there. So the documentary film is going to be coming out. It's going to be called Redesigning Her Story. Fantastic. And uh, the, the tagline is women of graphic design in America. 
Brilliant. And um, we have an amazing all-female design agency creating our visuals for it. And we're going to be having a meeting coming up with them to talk about how that's coming. Uh, Nina Stossinger, which is from Germany, and she works here in the United States in New York with uh, Tobias Farah Jones at his agency. She has a typeface that she designed where she's submitting that as the typeface that's going to be used on the visual identity. Um, we're going to be talking with, and we've already had some uh, interviews already, um, Ellen Lupton, um, Ruki, and Ruki, I apologize, but trying to say Ruki's last name, but she's the one of the curators and uh, lead people at the uh, education, oh my gosh, Lepterius, I, I should have probably wrote all that down, um, at the Cooper Hewitt. Smithsonian Museum um, for Design Education. Um, Gail Anderson, Jennifer Morella, I've already mentioned Elizabeth and Libby Meggs, um, April Greenman, if I've not mentioned that already, Susan Carr. Um, it's such an, a, an extensive list. But we're also talking with these young folks from, from just any old design school. Carrie Smith, I say any old design school, but they'd be like, what? That's my alumni. Or those faculty members would be like, we're not any old design school. Um, one of those is one of our graduates from the University of Central Oklahoma. Her name is uh, Michelle Underwood. She's in Chicago. Um, Carrie Smith, with it, which I just mentioned, is in Los Angeles working for a record company, uh, working on a lot of their visuals. So we're, we're not just focused on the legends, we're focused on women of design, women of design from times gone by and those that have left us and left their legacy to women designers that are just starting out. And, you know, we're looking at what that story is and, and how these pioneers in design have changed, changed the path for women designers. Mm -hmm. If we look in the classroom today, how many, you know, what's the ratio of, of male to female in the United States? It's about, you know, um, if we take 10 students, it's probably an eight to two or a seven to three, um, where the majority of the 70 to 80% are female uh, students. So design has changed. And, and for sure, we want to tell that story of women in graphic design. Fantastic. That sounds like yeah. Redesigning her story. I think that is looking at a release date. It's about 2022. Um, we're in the very early stages. The pandemic has, has, has put such a hiccup in our plans. We were starting filming this summer. We had uh, scheduled to start in May uh, in New York City and uh, in Baltimore, uh, Maryland at MICA. And um, yeah, the, the pandemic, and we had everything scheduled and now we don't. So what we're doing is we're, we're doing a lot of podcast uh, discussions right now with the folks that we're gonna be interviewing in the film, not to talk about the issue of women in graphic design, um, you know, we're saving that content for the film, but what we're talking about is um, what we should be aware of. What should we be looking for? What should we be avoiding? Uh, mm -hmm. We talk about them and their work. Um, so we're, we're, we're finding a separation between the podcast and kind of using that as teaser uh, material and, and really strong content <clears throat> for women in design and those designers, but saving... Um, saving the heart and soul of what the documentary film is supposed to be for the documentary. Brilliant. Brilliant. How can our viewers and listeners find you? Oh boy. Um, you can find me on the web, uh, of course, right? Social media. So um, PeteBella.com is my personal uh, website where they can kind of look at um, a funny picture of me and some information about my research and my CV and my accomplishments as far as academics go. Um, you could follow my Instagram account if you want, uh, but that's a lot more random about my real life. <laughs> um, so that is, uh, Pete Bella Jr., Pete Bella Jr. Um, and I believe it's the same on Twitter. Uh, I, I don't, I don't tweet much. I, I just have a hard time, like trying to keep up with it all. Um, but my Instagram, you can see me, uh, drinking coffee. You can see me uh, imagining I'm in a Star Wars film, <laughs> you can see me in the great outdoors. Um, it's one of the things that have changed for me is uh, getting outside and, and getting into nature. Uh, and if if anyone can follow Lefterius on Instagram, because Lefterius is just making some amazing um, 
still life grabs of nature through the lens of his camera that are just stunning. Um, I want to hit like and love on every single one of them, but I'm like, am I being a stalker? <laughs> so, so yeah, so I'm out there, I'm on the web. Uh, I'm, I'm working on my, my agency and developing that. So we're in a transition. So if you went to twistcreativestudio.com, uh, you're just going to see an under construction page right now because um, we're rebuilding that. But uh, uh, peepellet.com for all the academic stuff. Um, and I have, of course, that faculty bio at uh, uca.edu for the University of Central Arkansas. Fantastic. Yeah. Any last piece of advice you'd like to leave us with? Uh, yeah. The, the first thing, the quick thing that comes to mind is don't overthink it. And, and I might, that might be too simple, but that's just the beauty in it. Mm. Right. Mm. Don't overthink it. Um, it. If, if it, if it's there and it presents itself, it presented itself for a reason. Um, if there's certainty, if there's clarity, if there's confidence, don't overthink it. Um, I've already said too often how I see students overthinking it and over designing and over pushing over conceptualizing. Um, I like to say it's not that hard, but when I say that to students, they laugh at me and they're like, but you've been doing this for, I don't know, 30 years or so. Right. And I'm like, well, maybe that's a part of it. Um, but I, yeah, I just think don't, don't overthink it. Um, simplicity, clarity. Um, it, if it's, if it's communicating, if, if it's, if it's coming to you, if it's working, you know, let that, let that live. It might not always be perfect. And uh, perfect is a very difficult thing to strive towards and, and strive to be. Um, let that, let it be what it is. And um, don't worry yourself too much on it. We're all human beings and we all face those same fears and challenges um, <clears throat> alike. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful discussion. Thank oh, you. you're welcome. <clears throat> I appreciate you wanting to listen. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your 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 expression really and your and your ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. All right. That's Take it. care, Lepteries. Bye. Bye. Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the team here of the New Art School and Design Deducts podcast. Our guest today is Laze Tivkov. Welcome, Laze. Hello, uh, Lefteris. Uh, it is really nice seeing you. Thank you for this uh, invitation to participate in your series. It's really a satisfaction and a pleasure for me, especially in these moments that we are all facing as a country. It's great to have you. It's great to have you. Thank you. So tell us about you and your work. Well, uh, I'm a graphic designer. Uh, I have been working for 12 years. I did my master's at uh, Warsaw at the Academy of Fine Arts, and that was really a special uh, you know, experience for me and an adventure because after finishing two years at the faculty here in Skopje, I, I, I got a scholarship to continue in Warsaw. You know, I, I have been always uh, admiring the Polish uh, School of Art and especially the poster uh, as a graphic design uh, deduction. So I, I thought that I, I, I would definitely be more than uh, uh, pleased, you know, and an honor to, to, to have the privilege to study there. I, I have been around a lot of famous uh, graphic designers and a lot of uh, artists, you know, we have been having open classes, a lot of professors were coming here, you know, and also with the Warsaw Poster Biennale, it was a special, uh, you know, occasion every time to, to join and to discuss other professors. After that, I stayed for, stayed for one semester with Professor Lech Majewski uh, to uh, assist him and um, then another <clears throat> year of postmaster stash 
to the Academy of Fine Arts in, in Wuj, where I have been uh, doing some multimedia projects. And uh, in the meantime, I, I had some certain experience with advertising there as well. So 2004, I have decided to come back to Skopje you know, and to uh, use somehow my my knowledge, it was really uh, challenging for me in that time, you know, because the what I have witnessed uh, seven years uh, studying, uh, working in Warsaw, you know, here was completely different. Uh, the idea of the design, of the universality, of the design, of the visual language, you know, was completely different. We were too much oriented to some kind of advertising. So, uh, you know, a few years uh, back, uh, I was going back to Poland, uh, then coming back uh, to Macedonia, you know, overthinking the ideas uh, and, uh, you know, noticing personally uh, the challenges <clears throat> which really caused uh, a certain disbalance, you know. So I decided that in uh, 2007, I'm going to open association of graphic designers. Uh, and try to change the things a little bit, move a little bit, show the other side of, of the design. And we gathered uh, a few designers, you know, back, back then it was kind of a really difficult and, and challenging to do such a thing because you were <clears throat> preoccupied or over-occupied with, with uh, advertising that and, and, mm. and uh, business, you know, it, it was really huge uh, uh, interest for any person to participate in, in this kind of industry and uh, to push uh, a little bit the frontier of, of the, the real essence of the design was really hard, hard, uh, uh, especially for me and for my team. Then we decided to open, uh, to start organizing uh, uh, international uh, competition uh, that is going to become later a festival. And we were uh, thinking, what should we do? You know, what should we do so we can uh, make people uh, <clears throat> be more interactive in, in our, uh, not just activity, but also interactive with the design. And we, we said that we are going to uh, make poster as, mm -hmm. a, as a medium that is uh, perfect for this kind of uh, situation because it connects people from different uh, segments and from different areas, right? We have different segmentation of the of the poster, and we we started with that. We announced the poster competition. After a few years, we 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 noticed that it's much more uh, challenging and progressive to work with students, you know. And this is where we made the break uh, break line in 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 our work. We completely divided, you know the. <clears throat> Skopje Poster Festival for students mm, only. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm really glad about that. Wonderful, wonderful. You seem to have answered many questions. Tell us about uh, your, your experience uh, in your work and then your, your transition in, into education. Well, uh, uh, this is really uh, something, uh, something different, you know, it is, it is happening in my life. Uh, I have noticed that it is happening with certain sequence of four or five years, you know, I, uh, I, I took uh, different challenges. <clears throat> uh, well, I was, I was participating actively in, uh, in uh, education, uh, but more as a lecturer, you know, or, or practitioner in a way how uh, how uh, the events that we have organized with the guest uh, lectures that we, we have been inviting here, you know, I was always interested in, in helping them, seeing their work, see how they relate to students, and I really loved that. And I had that experience, you know, with Lech Majewski that was really satisfying for me. And, so you were um, teaching in, in, in Poland as well? Yeah? I, I, I was assisting. Yes, of course, of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was assisting, you know, but more, you know, uh, it was a moment that you uh, admire, uh, you know, the, the call. And uh, that is very important because uh, the, the teaching is really a call. It is, it yes. is a mission. So, so, Absolutely. so you, you have to indulge with it so uh, you can understand really the challenges. And um, uh, I started, you know, slowly to organize workshop to work. I have been invited guest lecturer with the Skopje Poster Festival, you know, as, as well. This is how I, I end up at Marmara University for, for a certain period. 
And then uh, 2010, you know, uh, suddenly, uh, you know, I, I received a, a call to start, uh, you know, as a, uh, you know, person, a professional, a professional practice person to, to run certain lectures. Not long time after that, I become uh, assistant professor and uh, uh, later, you know, uh, now I'm associate professor. So I have been teaching more than I don't, 11, 12 years, something like that. Uh, but I never left behind what I had before. You know, uh, education is something that gives you really nice incentive in, in what are you working, makes you more aware of how things relate to others, how uh, how things are developing, how students are thinking how they are reconsidering what what are the challenges of the new era what is it bringing you know because uh by the way of how you interpret yourself and the way how you uh indulge uh, into this uh, interaction is very important with the final results you know and this input I, I'm really happy to, to do that because not that only students uh, can um, gain more out of out of this, but also I'm I'm improving myself mm -hmm. in this way. Uh, so that is why I decided that I'm I'm not going to uh, let that thing out, you know. Uh, but also I had other other uh, uh, work uh, behind me, you know. I had. Uh, uh, you know, the Skopje Poster Festival, the, the events that have been organized with that, you know, we also started European uh, Graphic Design Festival. Uh, I initiated Skopje Design Week. You know, we had, uh, especially I, uh, was really overworked, you know, sometimes, you know, mm. but th this was a satisfaction that was uh, really giving me, you know, the, the certain inputs in, in work. And that is very important, you know, because I really love what I, what I work. I, I, I really like what I do. Fantastic. So the, 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 the energy of everything that you've been doing, uh, how do you bring it into your teaching? Well, uh, first of all, I have to say that, uh, you know, a big sacrifice uh, has been done by my wife. Uh, you know, because she is also a creative person and she decided that she's going to take care about everything so I can, I, I can do, you know, everything that I do. But, uh, you know, uh, artists really, uh, in order to be good ed educator and pedagogues, especially in our discipline of art, they have to be good practitioners. They have to work. Uh, very quality design. They have to have any kind of communication. They have to relate to different people. They have to go into certain discussions and accept uh, new challenges in order to transfer the knowledge that they need mm, to the mm, students. Absolutely. Otherwise, yeah. Otherwise, you are just uh, you know the professor uh, that is uh, you know making your lectures uh, based on on everything that is written in books. And our discipline is really moving fast forward. It has different variables due, uh, due to different times. What, what do you feel has moved forward? And what do you feel has remained the same? Well, <clears throat> the, uh, the very fast moving is a technology, definitely. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question here is, do we have to follow the technology? Do we have to understand the technology, first of all, or should technology start understanding the designers more or maybe art more. Why? Because uh, in order to, to use that technology, you need the, de the design at the end, right? Because uh, how you can shape something that is so inspiring or maybe new to understand. And we, we can notice different discrepancies in the time, uh, time uh, age or uh, the gaps that, uh, that, uh, that come into our life, but on the other hand, we really forget what is very important, you know, the, the, the emotion that connects the people, you know, through, through uh, real understanding, real seeing, re, uh, real enjoying in, 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 the, in the life, and especially art, you know, and these are the things which are very important. I mean, it's, it, it would be much easier to understand the technology, but then at the end, you will have to shape something which is really, uh, um, you know, completely new and different, and you will ask for the designers, and the designers are, are the universal soldiers, and they're they are really all, always in the front of, of the new challenges. 
mm-hmm. and uh, especially in these times you know these times of 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 uh, everything that is happening to us with the, with the quarantine and especially the isolation you know is is making us understand that we are the ones who are responsible for making life much more easier this is how we take the challenges and at the end you know uh, the, the first uh, the first actions that were uh, taken worldwide were, were taken by, by the artists and the designers mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in order to solve the functionality on, of the inpatients, mm-hmm. in order to, functional, uh, to create a better functionality for the uh, visual communication regarding corona, you know, and the way how you design the suits, you know, protection masks and stuff like that. Yes, of course, of course. Design has design, uh, always played a very important role in that. Um, I mean, you, you, you have experienced the Polish education tradition, um, which uh, st- starts from, from, from the art. It's always th- so you start as an artist and you become a designer. And uh, that's something I love in the Polish system because it's, it's quite uh, different to, to how a lot of design schools today uh, are, are handling education. Uh, so, is is that the same in 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 in, in where you are teaching now? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, education is uh, the most important segment in every person's life. Mm. Uh, what I, I I noticed now, uh, the what are we uh, we really uh, going through is uh, really a certain alarm, you know. And I'm not just inspired to say that by the ambulance that just passed, uh, but also you know it it's a certain uh, alarm for the whole uh, system, especially for the art. And art is the most important thing, you know. And I can say this because I was also. Uh, director of the Museum of Contemporary Arts here in Skopje for for almost two years, you know, and this is another segment of me taking new challenges, you know, and accepting the challenges. And uh, um, we are uh, creating a, a certain system based on 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 different appreciations in in art and. Regarding the Polish school, we can see a certain tradition, but this tradition is not just in the way how you uh, relate to the poster or how how poster relates to you. You know, it's also about something much more deeper, the main essence that it it connects. You know, I learned from my professors that in order to create a a personal uh, uh, touch of, of art, you know, you will have to put in a, uh, salt and pepper so you can spice your your ideas and this, this is very important an understanding of this spicing is different that is individual mm-hmm. but uh, uh, on, on the end the, the audience will say it's worth so uh, they have uh, they, they have uh, they are stick with with their tradition you know of the underground um, uh, so-called uh, culture that that have been developed in the uh, communistic era. And that mm-hmm. is very important that uh, really they have tried and find the, 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 the real materia for, for the, the, the success. Uh, the poster, you know, it's, it's, it's not just another uh, medium that can create. It has a, a, a big responsibility because first of all, the poster is a medium of art. Poster uh, is the first medium that communicates any kind of information, no matter if it's political, ideological, informational, cultural, advertising, you know, on the basis of that poster or advertising, you get some kind of information about any kind of product. And the the way how uh, uh, design is, is taught there is with the real, uh, you know, uh, pureness of the idea and uh, an emotion, and and the end, you know, they they always mention spice it, you know, spice it with enough salt and 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 pepper, you know, because we all do different way, you know. I uh, we have been trying uh, cooking and stuff like that, you know. We all <laughs> prepare different things in a different manner and in a different way, and uh, this whole aspect, you know, I I always try to point out to my my students that is very important. Um, 
because uh, at the end we always forget that we have that responsibility and what we create here is uh, you know uh, uh, execution in design and the design that has no limitation you know in the uh, geographical context no matter if you take from east to west poster has to be understandable mm -hmm. you know it it has to speak this uh, this language of this visual language that is understandable no matter of the race, of the language, of the population. And it's very important. That is why I always consider poster in the in the front line and always promote. And I always think that this poster has to be included in, in, in the education pro, um, uh, program of our schools. Okay. Why? Because, uh, sorry, can I just uh, add something? Yes, of course. Uh, more. Uh, I, I um, during during the, my my work as a director of, of Museum of Contemporary Art, I have noticed you know a, a, a certain uh, uh, process uh, in the development, especially the, the development of you know the, the contemporary art and what is happening in the contemporary art. You can never divide hyperrealist or conceptual artists, right? Mm -hmm. They're all creating in this time of the contemporary art. But on the other side, designers, new media, and everything that is happening, they are not just following the trends in art and certain things, right? You of can course see not, some. No, of uh, course not. You can see some uh, uh, art criticians that uh, will say that art has ended in the 60s, and now everything that is happening is just copy paste, and then we live <laughs> in this copy paste culture. And, uh, but others will say, no, it's not true. You know, art uh, asks too many questions. Yes, but design has the responsibility to give the answer, okay. you know? Mm -hmm. And that is the straightforward street, you know? And, and it's like uh, you're in, in one uh, shorter street of three meters and you have to miss two cars. And you have to have the enough understanding, you know, to, to just pass two cars. Yes. So uh, basically, uh, to conclude uh, all, no. all, all this, you know, uh, it was just uh, uh, my, my understanding of that, you know, realize that, uh, realize that we, uh, we have to use now this, uh, this time that is happening to us, you know, this time is very important and now is the time of real art, you know. Usually, uh, usually we uh, we have uh, we we have been uh, visiting uh, uh, or not visiting museums in the time. Now we can we can do it virtually. Now we can virtually consume anything, you know. And now is the time and the the, the real challenge that uh, has to be made over certain generations, especially artists. No matter if they are graphic designers, you know. Uh, musicians, actors, or stuff like that. This learning, the way of learning, you know, through 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 digital content, mm -hmm. like uh, you know, online online courses and stuff like that, is uh, making certain uh, distrib uh, uh, distrib uh, sorry disturbances in the continuity of, mm -hmm. of of the education. Of course, of course. So we we have to overthink all of that. Yes, I mean, art always has shown us that there are many, many ways of looking at something. And I think that's the power. Uh, and that's what uh, can never stop, is that, especially if we look at the history, it's shown us that there are many ways of looking at the same thing. So uh, designers, we need to take the lessons from that and, of course, as you said very, very well, give, give the answers. Fantastic. So in design education, is there anything that you would like to change? Is there anything that you would like to do differently? Well, of course, you know, I, 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 I was always, uh, you know, trying to, to indulge more in that, you know, and I had the, the chance, you know, to do that uh, 2013. I, I, uh, I, I received a, an opportunity to open a faculty uh, of art and design in Montenegro. Uh, wow. uh, it, it was a private university, so it was another challenge uh, that I, I have taken and undertaken, you know, and uh, th then I had an opportunity, you know, to shape the program, uh, as I, I believe, and definitely, you know, 
uh, we are facing with big challenges uh, at, uh, at the end. You know, I'm, I'm again going to use this whole situation because if this situation would not happen, probably uh, we won't be discussing uh, about, uh, about the challenges uh, that uh, awaits us, uh, you know, on the on the road because we 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 don't have any kind of certainty. Certainty. We don't know what is going to happen mm. after uh, the summer break or what is going to happen 2021. You know, everything is everything going to be delayed or stopped. So education cannot stop. You know, uh, it's it's very important. Uh, I have been uh, reading uh, a lot about this. I, I have started to to write a certain article about that. Uh, that uh, you know, we should end this as soon as possible and open schools. Uh, that there is a certain approach of of uh, sociologists. You know, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we will make students uh, think that they know everything. And this is the problem, you know, uh, this is the problem, again, of not understanding the technology in a very, very well way or in, in, in the way that it, it should be. So education, on the other hand, you know, and especially the real, um, uh, the, the real power of, of, of art uh, and education of art of, of, or new artists is, is definitely has to uh, overtake a certain adaptations you know maybe we will be facing challenges to take students back to school you know because now they have commodity take the laptop in their hands in front of them you know lie in the bed and, and listen to your lecture uh they can smoke cigarettes you know they can make themselves coffee they can do anything you know but what about that you know mm -hmm. what what is going to happen so interactivity is something that is really missing this is the the moment that it really causes certain uh, problems and I, I i'm always mentioning this you know and i'm saying this you know because especially the, for for artists it's really challenging to provide the lectures like this because mm -hmm. what you see is just the result at the end when you when you give a brief or when you give a, a problem to be solved you don't actively participate in the process, you know, in between. So there is a certain va vacuum that is uh, created, you know, between uh, the problem and the solution. And you cannot, as an educator, as a professor, you cannot actively participate, you know, into uh, different labyrinths in what is happening to each, uh, each of the students, you know, to help him to upgrade. And you don't see this process. We, what we see is just the result. So definitely, I will uh, I will go back uh, to 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 the most important thing, you know, and and that is art. My my faculty had five years of drawing and and painting, you know. Some faculties don't apply that, and they say for designers it's not important to draw. Exactly. Any designer, you know, it's about thinking. You don't need to draw. And, but the other school will say, oh, you need to draw because this is how you learn fast to sketch your idea or to understand the issue. Of course, of on, course. On the other hand, more if you go Eastern, then you have a different issues there. You know, you have more drawing, more uh, fine art than applied art and, and uh, different things. It, we don't have to make a fusion, but we have to really look what is very important. And I, I, I strongly believe that the older system provided much better results for the education. Of course. I you mean, drawing, drawing is thinking made visual. It's visual thinking. We're talking about yeah. visual communication. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is a, uh, a position of, of, of this podcast is, of course, that if there's no hand hard eye coordination, there can be uh, a, a no deeper understanding of design. And this is a challenge I've always faced uh, in, in, in my teaching. And it's, it's, it's fundamental to have drawing. So how can we convince more faculties to, al to allocate more time and more resources to drawing? Uh, well, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, in, in any situation, you, you really need a strong will. And on the other hand, you know, uh, we all have gathered a certain experience thanks to this online teaching, right? And your podcast uh, are really fantastic uh, idea to measure uh, this kind of all uh, interactions, right? In the level 
of uh, positive and negative uh, uh, aspects of, of all of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we maybe we cannot make a certain change uh, over that, but maybe we can allow, you know, at least faculties uh, to uh, consider what is uh, what is important, you know, for the whole segmentation. If we take in consideration globalization, we will know where, where things are moving. But on the other hand, are, aren't we forgetting who we are? and what we are you know and the, uh, again you know this this situation uh proved us that we are all made of flesh and and, and meat you know mm -hmm. and we all take the same risks mm -hmm. like everyone else but uh, uh i think that first of all that the education should last longer definitely especially for us okay mm -hmm. Uh, definitely, this is uh, this is my belief. You know, I I, I strongly believe that uh, maybe three years is not enough to do that. You know, or or four years. You know, because uh, we have to understand that. And from what I see, you know, because in the first year usually students are awakened of 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 things. You know, they forgot to learn about life. In faculty, they start to learn about life, and what you teach them in at faculty, you know, you teach them something that they can apply to their kids, and this is very important. So uh, definitely, they start to awaken after second year to understand more. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I have um, I have the experience, you know, of, of running lectures, uh, you know, in, in in Europe in some countries. You know, I, I'm discussing with with my Colleagues, professors from different faculties. Uh, every time when we meet at Skopje Poster or, or any other event that I'm invited or participating, you know, we are talking about these these challenges. And and what I can see is uh, the the biggest problem uh, for the young generation in this moment is this. You know, this is uh, their device. You know, this is their life. And uh, uh, this is the first thing that has to be overcome. You know, and especially. Now they learn that this in this device they can they can find any kind of uh, research they can make you know where is the methodology of approach then so uh, reconsidering uh, and re-understanding uh, the real needs uh, uh, really in order to create a, a better situation and better goals I would definitely uh, you know uh, indulge more into art uh, drawing. Uh, uh, drawing and painting, I strongly believe that this is very important. Listen, we also have some art uh, techniques that are forgotten, that haven't been used, you know, because I believe that they are old, right? But uh, maybe learning uh, lithography is also something uh, maybe important or at least to know, you know. Also, uh, in some time, artists will face uh, printing issues, you know. He has to understand how the printing process is, is working. So there are many, many, many things, you know. I, I think that we have all forgotten because of a certain unity of all countries, you know, or creating a certain system of which is only measured, unfortunately, by ECTS, you know, European Credit Transfer System. But yes. it's not the same. No, if my not. students wants to go to Spain, you know, what will the school look there will be ECTS. If he comes here, you know, it's again ECTS, you know, not the syllabus, not the program, not the real meaning, you know, the credits cannot be a certain value because credits cannot help you in real life, I think, you know, your portfolio can. No, because of course, of course, because a credit system creates fragmentation, whereas whereas art and design is a unity. So the, 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 the problem of teaching things in modules and little credits and little modules is that it, it actually focuses, it actually tells students that this is separate. This is like, ah, you're going to learn this, whereas where we are all teaching, it's all, it's all art. We're teaching design in the context of art. And it's 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 a, it's a whole, but of course that takes that takes time. But modular systems uh, are a challenge. I remember I remember uh, my teacher Brian Love in mm. Kingston. He was furious when uh, the upper administration forced him to modularize the curriculum of illustration. And uh, I, I remember the expression of his face when he found out he was fuming because he had to cut it up. He had to chop up mm. what we call studio, what we call studio mm. practice, which is the one lesson, and everything else is plugs into the studio practice. Mm. Of course. But it's not a lesson in its own right. 
Mm. Uh, so that was uh, absolutely both your systems are, are, are a challenge. Um, yes. <clears throat> how can we help students uh, go into a career? What, what is the advice to students and graduates uh, that it can help them uh, get 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 a career better and easier? Uh, I. Um... I was running my studio uh, also uh, from 2014 to 2016. After that, I, when I, uh, uh, I became a director of the Museum of Contemporary Art, I, I had to uh, slowly uh, shut down the studio and I, I, I left it to some of my students to, to run, you know, and they, they were facing certain challenges when they need uh, uh, a guidance uh, or maybe leadership uh, which uh, lacks some kind of an initiative. Uh, I, I would definitely, uh, and then I definitely understand that uh, what uh, we always uh, lack uh, maybe in, the, in education, what you said about modularism is also applied, you know, on the contrast that when you have a studio, you have open studio and meet all the students there. You know, all actively participating, and and you can you can listen, and that is very important. You know, this is ex cathedra uh, that gives you the you know the the opportunity to do that. And in this moment, you learned also the leadership uh, sequences. You know, where you can uh, compare yourself or or at least uh, uh, compete with with uh, with others, older colleagues. Uh, so um, my advice would definitely be to. To, uh, first of all, to to work more, you know, uh, uh, working more is very important, you know, uh, especially now with the, the with all social media and with the all digital content. Uh, what we see is, um, you know, suddenly everything or something becomes a trend, and it is expected that more artists or designers practice that kind of trend. And uh, in design, you know, trend is something that comes and goes. And it's very important, you know, that, that uh, these trends has certain time limitation. You know, you are actual only in that time. But being more, uh, being more hardworking, curious, especially um, to travel more, uh, to actively participate in competitions. I always advise them, and the Scorpio Poster Festival is the only uh, <laughs> week in, in 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 the year where they can. Uh, meet or co-work with different uh, colleagues, you know, with different uh, professors, uh, you know, lecturers that 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 are coming, that we are inviting them. They they can participate in different workshops and they can really understand and see themselves where they hang, where mm, where they mm, really mm, are mm, on mm, the scale. Mm. Uh, also, I have to uh, mention one more thing. You know, I was invited to to make a a, a lecture. And workshop in in uh, China. It was uh, two or three years ago. I, I couldn't uh, go then. I I, I had some uh, health issues, and uh, what I really uh, uh, what I was told later, but by the friends that went there, the designers, you know, is what I see every year in the Skopje Poster Festival, you know, and other poster festivals. I'm also. Uh, part uh, and um, you know our Skopje Poster Festival is supported by the Warsaw Poster Biennale, so we are having a uh, certain discussion meeting with uh, with with them. You know, we 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 talk. We are part of this uh, community and committee as well. You know, um, uh, we uh, we are uh, facing with uh, uh, a positive invasion from China. Uh, you know, there are more than 800 uh, artists, and I always ask them, you know, how are you going to measure with them? How are you going to compete with them? You know, only on one faculty, there are 10,000 students of graphic design. How many graphic design designers end or finish, not just in, in my country, but region, you know? And uh, uh, regarding that, you know, competing, uh, you will definitely uh, have to prioritize your goals. And uh, it's really difficult, you know, on a social media uh, or so to use the social media for certain kind of, of promotion for yourself, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, our lives has been uh, has been uh, reducted to the hashtags uh, and uh, to the comments uh, related to that. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, we really, uh, I, I personally really miss uh, uh, social interaction with 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 uh, with them, with the students, with the mm-hmm. with normal with with the people, you know, all over the world. Of so, course, of course, of course, of course. How can uh, our viewers and listeners find more about you and your work? Well, they can find me on uh, Instagram uh, by Skopje Posterov. Uh, uh, name uh, that that surname I have been using because people uh, have been under, uh, seeing me or uh, remembering me by the poster that I'm I'm doing. So uh, uh, also on LinkedIn they can they can find Skopje Poster Festival. I'm I'm active also on Facebook. My web page is uh, because I I I restarted a little bit my studio now. Wonderful, wonderful, and, uh, fantastic. Uh, try to work more and uh, my web page is under construction now. I have to collect everything, you know, in this time, uh, you know, um, we are we are really uh, having uh, enough time for everything and for nothing. Exactly. So we have to really uh, <laughs> start opening focus. the drawers and, and, and really look back again to the focus. So it, it, it has been really difficult for me, you know, in the past uh, 13 years or uh, 16 years since I, I have been back from Poland, you know, I have been working a lot, but I, I, I never like uh, systemized all that for myself, you know, personally, I, I, I have been always focused more on, on different challenges or trying to fix a bigger, uh, bigger challenges, you know, and, and the promotion. And I'm really proud about that, you know, uh, with, with what has been accomplished, but now it's a, a little bit time to to be focused on, on myself as special. Wonderful, wonderful. So any any last piece of advice you'd like to leave us with? Well, yes, uh, I, I really would love, uh, you know, you to continue your work. I, I, I really hope that this will become a, a, a bigger uh, issue. Uh, Thank you, thanks so much, important. thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed our discussion, uh, you know, I. I never stop working. I really would like, uh, you know, uh, that to be the advice to all artists and designers so that uh, if you want to accomplish something, you know, you, you, you should really work, work very hard, you know. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is the challenge that is facing us because um, history uh, has written many things, you know. Uh, and uh, what is uh, happening now, we can understand it uh, maybe after 20 years. Mm, uh, mm. Maybe then will be written and maybe uh, then we will see what, uh, what has been happening. But, you know, always to work and to understand that really uh, design changes the world. And this is the, this is the proof that it's Absolutely. happening and we Absolutely. can all be part of that. You know, uh, also, uh, you, you, you couldn't contact it contacted me if you if you didn't follow or you didn't understand what is really of happening course, and, and you know uh, again and through my work as well so I'm, I'm really glad about that i i wish you all the best thank you thank you really for approaching to me because this was a great uh, challenge well, it's a great and pleasure and, and well. we and we hope to see you as well in the conference in this, this november and, thank you very uh, much of course of course of course have a fantastic uh, day and we'll be we'll speak soon. Thank you. Take care. Thank Take you. Care. you too. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to Valencia Design Education Forum. Well, a lot has happened since last year. Last year, we were gathered uh, physically. Uh, we have about 300 people from all over the world. And this year, we are 100% broadcasting, 100% virtual. Uh, still, we're going to make this a very exciting two days. Uh, right now, at uh, 4 o'clock Central European time, uh, we're going to have our keynote speech by none other than Carol Vrendenberg, the uh, head of design at IBM. Uh, then we're going to have a series of, uh, of presentations. And in the end of today, uh, we're going to have uh, our, our panel with today's speakers. Tomorrow, uh, again, we begin with a series of uh, talks at uh, 10 o'clock Central European time. Uh, around 11 o'clock Central European time, where there's going to be a panel on artificial intelligence and design education, followed by a series of uh, talks. And then we're going to have, again, speakers panel at the end. Uh, so this is going to be a very exciting two days. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers and everyone who sent material for participation. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Phil Cleaver and Etol Design for uh, creating our branding this year. It's fantastic branding, as you can see all around us. Uh, and I'd also like to thank everybody who contributed, uh, both financially and with uh, or an effort, with their efforts to make this uh, a fantastic event. So sit back, enjoy, and uh, we're going to be beginning uh, very shortly uh, with our keynote. Thanks so much, everyone.
Hello everyone, we are back and we have the honor of having Karel Vrindeberg with us and he's going to uh, give his fantastic keynote speech. Welcome, Karel. Great. Thanks so much, Lefteris. I want to thank you, first of all, for inviting me to the session uh, today. I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing my thoughts and then getting some Q&A going at the end as well. So let me just share my screen it's here. It's an honor. It's an honor. Uh, for the viewers, you can send your questions to uh, YouTube, to the live stream, and to the Facebook, the New York School channel. So make sure you still have your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. And so what I wanted to share with you today is sort of the, the experiences and thoughts with regard to educating designers and others for the current and future world. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm currently the director of IBM's Global Design Leadership. That's essentially the leaders across the entire uh, company that are leading design. Um, and uh, also our academic programs. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm also the head of IBM Studios Canada and our innovation core. And I'm an industry professor at McMaster University. So the things I want to cover uh, today are, first of all, the uh, transformation that the IBM company has gone through over the last eight years. Um, also a little bit about our need to close educa education gaps that we noticed while we were doing that transformation because we were hiring a lot of uh, designers. And that led to some uh, university curricular prototypes that I did personally. And then we broadened that out to working with and collaborating with uh, universities and design schools around the world. Uh, and that led to some perspectives on design that I'd like to share. And then I want to finish up with a, an overall initiative that we're running now uh, called the Future of Design Education uh, Project. So let me start by telling you a little bit about sort of the transformation the IBM company has gone through. So we usually use the term pivot to refer to a, a, a drastic fo refocusing um, of a startup. Um, but my argument is that uh, even 100 year, year plus uh, old companies like IBM uh, can and should pivot as well. So the IBM company some uh, eight years ago needed to pivot because all of the technologies and all of the markets that the IBM company was in um, we're drastically changing. So we needed to pivot the company in almost each of those uh, markets and, and technology areas. And so we also got a new uh, CEO at the time and the person of Ginny Rometty, who was brilliant and who also gave our design organization this objective to create a global sustainable culture of design and design thinking at IBM. Some key words there, sustainable, and actually focusing on the culture of design and design thinking across a massive uh, large company. So what did we do? We basically put together a, an overall transformation plan that was led by somebody that came into the company some three years before that uh, in the name of Phil Gilbert. He had been running a company uh, that IBM acquired called Lombardi Software, uh, which just did an awesome job at design and design thinking, top to bottom of the company, side to side. And so Phil uh, and a few of us um, put together basically this transformation plan for the IBM company. And one of the things that I did was introduce that new model, and I'll tell you more about that model in a minute. Uh, to the company. Uh, so I basically in uh, 2013 went around to all IBM uh, product studios or uh, uh, labs around the world where we develop products and we have a lot of those and introduce them through um, town halls and uh, individual uh, meetings and the like. So for all of our product organizations to get with our program. Uh, and then the next year was focusing on our services organization that works directly with clients. Um, and then we have these uh, garages that really work on sort of innovation kickoffs and incubators with companies. Uh, we also injected uh, our design system into those. Another organization, the technology services organization, even focusing uh, on and working with our sales organization so that they could really adopt 
design sensibilities with regard to designing what they're doing, uh, an engagement with a client to really deeply understand that a client from their point of view, rather than thinking about whatever they had on the truck that they wanted to sell, so to speak. And then since 2019, the beginning of 2019, I've been working with academia. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about here is the work we've been, have been doing there. So what was really part of our design system? Our design system uh, is what we call enterprise design thinking. It has these core components to it, a set of principles, focusing on user outcomes as the primary uh, focus. Uh, also on the far right, diverse empowered teams. And we take that quite literally in terms of making sure that we have teams that are diverse in all respects. And we have a lot of work to do in that area still, but also very importantly, focusing on empowered people that can actually run with the design work that they're uh, coming up with. Um, and then we have, have a focus on restless reinvention, which is also what's in the center of this chart, our loop observing, reflecting and making, and I'll go a little bit more into that uh, detail into that in a minute. And then very importantly, we also wrapper all of this with what we call the keys. We have these notion of hills, three basically statements of intent. What would the end result of what it is that we're designing, you know, uh, look, look like and work like for the person that it's intended for? And uh, they're in the form of who is gonna be able to do what with what wow experience. And we have this notion of playbacks, which is basically sharing the evolving uh, experience of uh, a user with whatever product or service we're developing and getting input from all the key stakeholders on that on a regular basis. And then last, certainly, but not least, our focus on what we call sponsor users, rather than going to many, 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 many hundreds of users, we really want to find appropriately representative users and a small number, all of like four or five or so that we're going to work a lot with like several hours, hours a week. So that's our, so, so that's our overall focus on sort of enterprise design thinking. We also figured that what we needed to have was an environment that would be conducive to design and making sure that we didn't have what is often the case for companies. And that is um, people sitting in cubicles and it's the fastest way to suck creativity uh, and innovation and collaboration uh, out of people. So we wanted to create studios that were collaborative and, 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 and encouraging creativity and innovation. So we now have uh, close to 100 of those uh, studios around the world, uh, but those studios mostly look like this today, um, just like the way we're communicating with one another today as well in this, uh, this conference. Um, but they still are uh, studios that work together and collaborate with, with one another and skill, uh, have skill change, exchanges and the like as well. We also went from about 230 designers eight years ago to 2,500 uh, designers uh, formally trained um, now. And we did that with a impress intentional uh, focus of making sure that we had ratios in our you know, product and services organizations that were appropriate to make sure that we had, for example, uh, at least one designer for uh, for every eight uh, eight to 12 uh, developers, for example, um, making sure that it wasn't the case that as we had years ago, uh, where, you know, you, you have a question of, do you have a designer? Yes, we have one. Well, no, let's actually plan the number of designers we need and also the particular expertise that we need, visual design, uh, user experience uh, design, user research, content design, et cetera, all, um, focused on what skills do we need and how many of those do we need uh, on the team. We also though did an assessment, and this is directly relevant to the conversation that we're gonna have here, on the skills that people came in from the various design schools and what skills were missing. So we actually asked our uh, hires, people that came into the company, you know, that after they'd been in the company for you know, a year or two or three, uh, ask them this question, please indicate what was missing or insufficient in your formal education as a designer. And what was interesting at the bottom left of this chart is that the primary discipline skills, largely the craft skills, they're fine. 
I think schools do a great job at, at teaching craft skills, but a lot of the rest of these percentages you see are missing. So the bottom right, a huge focus on multidisciplinary collaboration. I mean, designers come in not knowing the vocabulary or the biases or, or the kinds of things that engineers, um, computer science students, uh, or, or business students, the way that they work. And conversely, each of those disciplines, by the way, has that same problem, right? They all come out of their own discipline silos. And so a huge challenge in coming to work in a place like IBM, and I would submit any organization that has multiple disciplines, was actually learning about and then working with those other disciplines on a team to be able to actually create any outcomes that are effective. Also a real focus on the top left, working world knowledge. Uh, a lot of the time, and this is uh, together with complex real world problems, a lot, a lot of the time students will have done one little project that they chose for themselves um, and they hadn't had any experience uh, of what actual um, design work in the working world feels like and looks like uh, and smells like. Uh, so that's another major uh, gap that I think we need to fill while people are uh, in their educational period at uh, university and design schools. And then last but not least, actually focusing on design thinking theory and practice and doing it properly. And a lot of schools uh, don't teach it at all, um, and which I think is a mistake. And then a lot of schools also teach it incorrectly. And I'm going to be getting into that as well. And a lot of organizations, uh, I think, do an incredibly ba a bad job of um, using design thinking incorrectly. So what did we do? Uh, so if we had those gaps, we developed a, a three-month boot camp for all new hires. Uh, initially, it was just design, but over time, it was also, we realized the same uh, skill gaps existed for business and also front-end uh, development engineering. So we basically brought people into Austin, Texas in the U.S. for a three-month period to basically close those gaps so that after those three months, they could actually go into the, the teams they're going to be working on uh, and actually be successful. We also decided to activate and we use the term activate rather than educate because uh, we use you know experiential learning in all of this a little bit of instruction but a whole lot of just learning while doing with 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 guidance and coaching so we also created a one week activation session for our product teams so the whole uh, like two people from the design team two people from business two people from engineering from a product organization would come uh, essentially for a week and actually work on their products while using and learning uh, actively the design thinking methods that they were learning. Um, and then we did that for a while. And some months down the road, we'd go back to those teams that had gone through that one week activation, for example, and said, how's that going? And they would come back and say, you know what? We love working this way. This is so, so good. I mean, we're doing things with some of the methods we're using now that um, after having worked on a product for like 15 years, a 15 minute exercise using these design thinking methods gives us insight that um, in 15 minutes that we didn't get for 15 years working on this product. And like, so super powerful, you know, methods, but the feedback was that there was a problem and that is the executives above them were still expecting them to produce a high fidelity prototype after the first week of working on a product, for example, um, when in actual fact, the uh, team now knew how to go and do some user research to really come up with the, uh, the challenges and the like that the users were having that they needed to address with design. So we also figured that we needed to do some activation for executives, which we did uh, a one day session um, with everybody from the C-suite, basically right from the top of the company all the way through uh, all the executives in the company as well. So if you want to change the culture of an organization, these are the kind of things you need to do. And then we also created a, a governance system, basically uh, reviewing progress and making mid-course course corrections and the like, and then applied all these methods to our top product areas and also to our services with clients uh, as well. Now, we did all of that in person. 
uh, in like those those three month boot camps, the one week, uh, uh, um, you know, education sessions and activation sessions with product teams and the like, and also the executive ones. They were all in person, and we also decided that if we we're going to really scale this through a massive uh, company, then we needed to put a lot of this online as well, which we did. So we now have. Uh, online education that you can win badges doing. Uh, and so, and that I say that uh, uh, with some uh, careful choice of those words, uh, people actually really uh, value getting these badges after they've attained the the right level of knowledge and mastery. And so it starts off with doing a, a practitioner badge, which is basically a two hour introduction to these methods then a, um, a collaborative experience of actually doing work together with others for um, a period of time uh, can lead to the co-creator badge. And then the coach badge is, is more difficult to get, uh, but it's one that where somebody can actually lead and, and, and coach others uh, doing it as well. And then we have other uh, badges for people that are leading, not doing uh, the work as well, uh, the advocate and leader badge as well. Now I should just mention, so when we think about these design sensibilities and design thinking is a way of uh, uh, putting those together for people that are on a full team. Our view here really for designers and others is this notion of the T-shaped person. This whole notion of saying, you know what, you have your deep skills, your you know, core discipline skills, which is basically the, the vertical stroke of the T, if you will. Um, and you need to further develop that. And, and there's some uh, encouragement that we provide to make that wider as well, to just learn more skills from other disciplines and like. But I wanted to make the point that the horizontal stroke of the T, and these are the kind of skills that everybody should, should have, um, that's really where we place enterprise design thinking, that we expect everybody in the company to really be using these methods and these design sensibilities in everything that we do. And so, um, and some people say, well, you know, does that take power away from designers? Heck no. Designers can work more effectively when you have the, the whole team using very appropriately uh, educated and then, and then practiced design thinking. But I'd like to also make the point that you have to do design thinking properly and not do what I like to call innovation theater, which I would submit that about, I don't know, 80% of all the organizations uh, that are using design thinking are using innovation theater. They think they're being creative. They've got some post-it notes and Sharpies, and they might even be doing that digitally now, um, but they're not really doing it properly. And in fact, it's probably giving design thinking a bad name in the way that they actually practice this. So let's think about that loop that I talked about earlier, the notion of, of, of observing, really doing the user research, reflecting, doing the design thinking, uh, sort of workshopping methods, and then also actually making. So what if you only do the observing and reflecting and you don't ever make? Well, that's analysis paralysis. You're never actually going to create anything if you do that. What about if you only do the design thinking methods um, uh, of, of, of ref, uh, ref, what I'm calling reflecting, um, and then you're going directly to making from that. And we call that flying blind because you don't actually have input with regard to understanding the users appropriately to be able to inform the design. What if you don't even do the design thinking methods itself? Uh, we like to call that sort of taking orders. You're basically just observing and then directly putting that into like a product design. And that is a formula for, I think, building a monster of, of, of products uh, in the sense of you're not carefully prioritizing what needs to go, go in. And so you're going to put way too much into the product because it's going to make, make it way too unusable and too complex. What if you only do the design thinking um, methods of, you know, the workshopping methods? Uh, and you don't do the other uh, that I talked about. That's what I call innovation theater. So you're not doing any user research. You're not actually creating anything after the result of these methods. Um, argue that if that's what you're going to do, don't do it.
Uh, don't even use design thinking if that's how you're going to actually uh, practice it. You need to make sure that you're actually doing the work of understanding users appropriately by doing user research, ethnographic observation and interviews and that kind of thing, using the design thinking methods to really reflect on those using empathy mapping, using as a scenario mapping and the like. And then you want to also ideate and then now create prototypes initially in paper and pencil in doing the making of these uh, ideas that you're, you're, you're exploring. And then really importantly, you're going to be going through this loop many, many times. You're going to be iterating. You're going to be learning you know, as you go. That's truly how I think the design sensibility of design thinking really should be practiced. The other thing that I wanted to share is that we also, uh, in addition to those methods, uh, we also have this notion of a target skill model and that somebody that we hire comes in from, you know, design school or business school, or, uh, whatever, uh, and has their core discipline, which is great. This is how they sort of come in. They, they only have the stuff on the left side. And then what we need to do as well, in addition to kind of the training that I talked about, was also getting knowledge about the domain that they're going to be working in you know, both the industry and the technology uh, domain, and also sort of the business strategy. And the way we see this is that once you've actually got that started um, early on, that's where you get some uh, initial spaces for innovation and excellence. But it really takes knowing your core discipline, knowing all these other, you know, multidisciplinary experiences and all the things that I talked about earlier, together with the domain knowledge of where they're, where they're working, uh, and also the business strategy to truly get innovation and excellence in you know, product and services uh, design. So when we've done all of that, and we've done that for a number of years now, um, we also are now delighted that we're now getting, and this is like in one year, uh, last year, we got uh, 40 plus uh, product design awards from the work that we're doing. So we know we're doing something right with regard to that. Well, what about actually the um the total economic impact and here forrester uh, did a study uh also of particularly our of our clients and to the surprise of many people who think that doing things this way slows you down and that it's very expensive and that return on investment won't be very high in actual fact you can get to market twice as fast if you do this stuff correctly you're going to be understanding the market better and users better. So you're going to make uh, fewer mistakes uh, in terms of getting that uh, wrong and then being able to actually uh, very quickly um, build what it is that users want to have. And also they uh, determined there was a 300% return on investment with the investment in design and using design thinking. And they did also did an unaided recall of uh, asking the question, what organization comes to mind when we say design thinking? And some 52% of uh, industry leaders uh, came up with IBM as that, um, as that name. So all the work that I was just talking about uh, earlier about really changing the culture of IBM and making a sustainable culture of design and design thinking is not only leading to kind of the, the design outcomes that we want in terms of the awards and like, but also uh, some good uh, uh, metrics outcomes as well as articulated here. So let's, let's think about a little bit about the education uh, itself um, and digging into it some more. So I got involved in this largely because I, in those early days, and this is in 2015, um, I was traveling the world uh, and working with our our design organizations. And uh, I went to uh, the UK, went to uh, London and had a, a conversation with our teams there. And it was the end of a day that they had done a bunch of interviewing of students uh, in order to determine whether we we're gonna hire them, hire them. And we have a very rigorous uh, method for doing that. Um, and we also have a, a, a rigorous sort of analysis that uh, whether somebody meets the bar or not. And I think that they had interviewed some eight uh, students during the day and they said, hey, Carl, you want to talk to you because it turns out that none of the eight actually met the bar uh, for hiring that we had. What should we do? And I think they had like three headcount um, of, of hiring tickets that they had. And they were worried that this is getting toward the end of the year, that they might, might lose that uh, sort of headcount. Uh, should they, you know, choose the best of the ones that they did interview, or should they still keep 
that bar high? Um, and could I help them make sure that they could keep that headcount? And that's essentially what I told them is that, you know, well, I'll do what I can to make sure that you keep the headcount, but let's even keep that uh, bar high. And so that, then we didn't actually hire anybody, uh, anybody out of that day of interviewing. And what was interesting was right after that, I actually had a, a meeting with the uh, the director of the um, uh, design council in the UK, and we started talking about you know design at at at, um, at the various design schools uh, and, and the like about some of the gaps that we we're seeing that I've talked about uh, already, and uh, and also about this notion that we had this three uh, month boot camp. And so we started our conversations there. And then right after that, ended up having an interview with the press about um, where any questions that they wanted to ask. And it turns out that we also got into this conversation. Now, they ended up making it this headline, the IBM uh, design director, UK universities need to create better designers and more of them, which is really an overstatement of what I was actually saying. Um, but and it wasn't limited to the UK and it wasn't that they were uh, uh, so um, uh, problematic. It's just that there were there were additional gaps and skills that we talked about here already that we needed to add in uh, as well as in addition to their core sort of uh, craft skills and the like. So what was interesting about this was that this led to a lot of conversations with, uh, with the design schools and universities in general. And that led me to locally, I'm based in Toronto, Canada, uh, to work with some local schools here and actually uh, created what I consider to be some curriculum uh, prototype. So uh, developed a multidisciplinary real world problem focused pan university course for a variety of disciplines so that they could all learn to how to work together and also use these design thinking kind of methods. Uh, also developed programs for emerging health leaders uh, as well as an executive MBA program and even one for board directors that should also be thinking and working in this way as well. And then after having done that, and that yielded really, really positive uh, outcomes, and those uh, programs were really, really popular, usually limited by the whatever room size we uh, could uh, get the students into, um, that we also decided to focus on basically um, opening the aperture of this sort of, uh, I started this just locally here, wanted to start working and collaborating with way more schools also that changed the, the the engagement to be even more broad than that and then also to broaden the scope of uh, not only design but also uh, other uh, disciplines as well so what i did was uh, focused on design schools and uh, identified sort of the top ones uh, based on rankings um, research universities that also had design business and engineering schools and then also in the United States, focused on historically black colleges and universities uh, as well. And the form of that engagement was uh, we used to uh, charge, we don't anymore now, uh, for the um, online education that I talked about earlier that we have. Um, and But we made that uh, available for free uh, to the schools that we're working on uh, working with so they could learn the, the practitioner uh, badge and we encourage uh, teams to and this is what I do with my teaching as well uh, that two hour uh, uh, introductory course is one that uh, students need to uh, actually take before they uh, start the, uh, the the class and then they can earn the co-creator uh, badge uh, throughout the uh, a like a capstone or a project based class because they're also working with others on it and that co-creator course basically uh, I, I characterize as an additional sort of digital um, uh, teaching assistant uh, in the course uh, is the way to think about how we use those. So we also did a variety of other things like uh, curriculum workshops, uh, uh, doing keynote uh, addresses at uh, universities, working uh, with them with uh, uh, workshopping these methods, designer panels, talking about what the experience of being a professional designer is like uh, and the like. And also really basically customized what it is that we were doing with each of the schools um, and basically working with, for example, the presidents and, and, and uh, um, provosts of, of schools, uh, of design schools themselves, as well as, you know, the deans and, and, and faculty at um, uh, the schools within universities uh, as well. And they determined what it is that we wanted to work on together. But all of this also 
uh, provided a view of the effective patterns uh, for, over, uh, for all schools as well, which I'm gonna get into in a minute. So what did we do? We did things like a hosted um, senior um, uh, executive uh, uh, talent uh, from like president and uh, provost and the like uh, from the Art Center uh, College of Design as well as Northwestern uh, University. We had them at our Austin studio. Um, Brown University and RISD, we've done a number of things, you know, with uh, both with the faculty and with students and also helping them develop a new um, new master's program uh, for design and engineering, um, working with the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm going to be doing a, another course, <laughs> teaching a course there in a couple of hours from now. Um, doing a keynote, doing panel cl a, a class and, and also um, being a judge in a in a uh, design competition. Um, Working with the, Danf uh, the Stanford D School, uh, and in particular there, uh, providing a new perspective uh, that isn't there currently or wasn't there currently. Their focus is, is very much on entrepreneurial um, education uh, for design and design thinking. And um, I wanted to introduce, which I do now on a regular basis, sort of a, an enterprise focus you know, as well, uh, so that a number of students that uh, may well be thinking about, you know, uh, entrepreneurial design, you also want to get into entrepreneurial design, be able to actually create create new ideas, new products and the like inside uh, larger companies as well. Um, we did some teaching and work workshopping at the Oxford Foundry. Um, also, with these historically black colleges and universities that the United States has uh, are really, really important for uh, really the diversity of our teams and really ensuring that we have uh, a representative uh, um, uh, sort of balance of, of the various uh, um, racial uh, sort of compositions of our groups and the like. And so we've been doing a lot of work for the last two years uh, with those schools, with doing uh, keynotes, uh, career talks, workshops, and competitions as well. We also did a thing with a lot of uh, students, uh, as well as faculty and even deans of design schools, as well as uh, about 100 uh, IBM uh, designers as well on something that at the beginning of um, the whole pandemic, uh, where we got together with the World Design Organization and Design for America and ran a COVID-19 design challenge, which was really an interesting thing from the point of view of designers that have been focused largely on craft, having their first experience with actually trying to solve real world problems using these methods as well and realizing how powerful they can be, but also how to more effectively be able to do that, which is often not the way that we teach this work as well. Here, another example, working with the University of uh, San Diego um, engineering and design uh, and a design course that we did, um, focused on improving the lives of Parkinson's patients and uh, the the head of that uh, uh, organization is actually Don Norman, who you can see in the, in the center of uh, this picture, who uh, is quite well known, uh, obviously, in the design circles, being sort of the guru and father of a lot of the work that we we're doing uh, uh, for for a lot of decades. I I based the uh, the first um, prior to design thinking, we worked on uh, user centered. Uh, design at IBM. And uh, I introduced that in the middle 90s to IBM based on uh, Don Norman's uh, work. So what, what happened, though, was that we ended up talking more about while we're doing this work at um, uh, UC San Diego uh, with Don and his team. Uh, Don and I really started to go talking about where design education was really at and where it could go. Uh, and so we had some conversations over dinners and the like over the course of about a year uh, on that. And that led to an initiative that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. But before I do that, I also wanted to just give you sort of my perspectives on design uh, that is informing some of the work that we're doing uh, together and also some of the work that we're doing uh, at IBM as well, which is really that, when I look at the, the three decades or so that I've been focused in this area, focused on design, I've really seen over the course of those three decades, a phenomenal change in really the power of design. And, you know, as a quickie story, uh, some, I think uh, about 15 years ago, I had this designer, a phenomenal designer actually, working with a whole development and business team, um, whiteboarding a design uh, of, a, of a product. And um, 
he just whiteboarded it all up. And then uh, a week later, they had another meeting and he said, oh yeah, I changed my idea. idea. I wonder, here's another way to, that, that we can design this product. And there was this almost revolt on the team uh, because they, had, they said, hey, look, they loved everything that he did and that he impl they had implemented everything that he had actually whiteboarded uh, during that week. And so they were really disappointed that, uh, that, that he had a dr drastically different design uh, uh, as well. But he had never experienced that before because in the past, designers wouldn't have as much power. It was sort of like, okay, here's the design. And then there's some elements of that that might get into the product. But we're now in a position in the world where uh, designers have a lot of power uh, and they can have a lot of impact with their with their design and that impact though can either be positive and negative so in the past you know the positive and negative impact was kind of minimal stuff on the left uh, part of that of this chart but you know toward the right of this chart we're now in a situation where the kinds of things that designers can um, uh, can impact uh, are, like I said, uh, so some great um, uh, positive things, amazing experiences for our users that are delightful, uh, ones that are just great for, for their mental health, great for the environment, et cetera, um, as well as the, the opposite of that, really doing a lot of design that's gonna, gonna create you know, mental health problems, people that are now you know, addicted to a product, uh, uh, for example, and that they're spending way too much time you know, uh, doing that. Um, designs that are gonna impact sort of the environment, uh, also uh, designs that are gonna impact the way that, that societies work and democracies work uh, uh, and the like as well. So I think, I mean, it's a great thing that we should celebrate that design is now so powerful, but it's also the case that we need to, with that power, realize that we need to take the responsibility to make sure that the design that we actually come up with is in the positive side of this as opposed to the negative. And a large part of that also has to be done, I think, in design schools and universities as well. And the other thing I would add is that, you know, the potential influence of design is just on the individual person, um, as we have, I think, for a long time uh, seen, but also it can have and can, you can use these methods to impact whole organizations and even all overall societies. Again, on the left side here, in a positive way, as well as a negative way. But the point is that design is not only powerful, it's also influential in a very broad way and can be in, in very broad ways. And so even you know, when, when I talked about that COVID-19 design challenge that we ran, the reality of that was people got their first taste of starting to use these methods for more than typically the work that they were being paid to do, the ones that were uh, professional designers in you know, creating something uh, within, their, within their company or organization. And so there, we have to also embrace, I think, that there is a, um, there's an aspect of changing the world that I think design can make a significant contribution to, but we also have to not just do that as a side effect, but that we also need to be looking at in, in, in specific ways so that we're actually teaching people to be able to use these methods to address those kinds of challenges as well. So we started this Future of Design Education project that is now running that, and my perspective on it um, is that, we're trying to open the aperture of design education really to address even the, the last two charts that I just showed you and focusing on design for society itself, uh, whether you're designing something that is a, 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 an object or, or a product uh, and thinking of the uh, implications of that design for society uh, or whether it's actually using these methods to explicitly address a challenge that society has. Uh, both of those I think need to be addressed. Um, designing for diversity, really making sure that we have an appreciation as well um, on a very popular topic is the focus on sort of decolonization and how much of the influence of sort of European tradition in a design um, should be balanced with um, 
a, a different perspective. And so a lot of the work on um, in North America uh, is focused on sort of indigenous uh, and black uh, culture and what kinds of um, contributions that can make that are very different. And a lot of the work, for example, in the indigenous uh, areas is, is also uh, very, very helpful and actually trying to uh, address designing products that are more sustainable. And so uh, there's just huge value in focusing in that area. The other one is to design for the future. A lot of the work that has been done thus far and a lot of the work on design thinking is simply to design for today. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic has also taught us uh, that the strategic foresight methods that, you know, some of us have been teaching um, are becoming, you know, front and center and that we can't do, for example, design thinking without also doing strategic foresight. Because, I mean, it used to be the case that would, people would do strategic foresight and think about what could things be like in 10 to 20 years from now. Uh, but now we need to use these methods to determine what might things be like, you know, weeks and months from now. <laughs> and so, and coming up with, you know, three different scenarios based on really understanding the trends and, and the directions that um, indicators can, can, uh, uh, can illustrate for us um, is critically important right now for anything that anybody's doing, anything that you're, you're doing in terms of even determining whether your company or your university is going to be going back on campus or uh, back in, 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 into, the, into the office. A lot of that work needs these kinds of design methods and you, and you need strategic foresight. Um, it's one of the things that I also teach to, um, to boards of directors of companies, you know, and organizations and nonprofits and the like as well now, now that we need to use these methods to really think about who it is that we're serving with those organizations and use these methods of design to be able to actually effectively design the organizations and the decisions that need to be made there as well. Designing for mental health is really important in the sense that, you know, a lot of the, you know, work that we've done in the area of, of, of social media and also some of the devices that we carry around, we're all so addicted uh, to this that it's, it's, it's really problematic. Even um, the over zoomification of our current sort of work from home and study from home um, requires a real focus on design for mental health uh, as well. Um, the platforms that we're using right now, you know, are, um, you know, Zoom and WebEx and the like um, haven't really done much other than maybe putting in a, a background that you can put in your, in your uh, Zoom uh, call. But what kinds of things could be done uh, with those technologies to increase sort of uh, mental health. And also when you think about all of the design work that's been focused on trying to make people addicted for the sake of, of, of the revenue that those products are gonna create, but we've got to think about what the downside of that is as well in terms of our, our real addiction to these uh, products as well. And then designing for the environment. Uh, we're realizing we're in this, you know, uh, incredibly sad state uh, in terms of what it is that we're doing uh, to the environment ha and have been. And I think designers need to have that responsibility as part of their thinking as well to uh, factor in uh, what kind of impact uh, the designs that they're going to come up with uh, will have on, on the environment. And then designing for new technologies, thinking about, for example, AI. Um, there's a huge opportunity right now to effectively incorporate um, appropriate knowledge of, of, uh, of the corpus of, of, of data that's going into uh, these AI uh, systems. We have a bunch of work uh, at IBM and some tooling uh, to even uh, assess uh, the bias of a data set, for example. Um, I'm reminded of the early uh, work that uh, Kodak did uh, on uh, Kodachrome uh, when they first came out with color uh, film and they needed to create um, the chemicals to be able to create a, a, a good rendition uh, of what that what 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 a group of people, for example, would look like, and uh, they optimized that uh, for white people. Uh, and so pictures that had uh, white people and black people in it um, uh, would end up showing, you know, the black uh, people without any uh, sort of features whatsoever, because they just messed it up. Well, how did 
Kodak actually realized that that's what they were doing. It was actually a European furniture maker that complained to them that the 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 different colors of wood uh, weren't being uh, shown well in uh, pictures that were taken with this Kodachrome, right? Um, and then they realized that, oh, not only that's a problem, but also the fact that they weren't being very uh, effective at actually uh, realizing the racial diversity of the people that needed to be shown in their in their pictures. And so they changed things afterwards. But that's stuff you can see, right? That's actually visual. I think a lot of the work that we're doing with AI now is not, it's invisible, right? So the kind of biases that can be built into these systems um, are, is, is huge as a danger. So again, designers need to think about when we're designing those systems, what kinds of things do we need to build in so that we're guarding against the bias and that we're also more effectively designing them for all people. And then the last thing is that it's sort of related to a lot of the things that I'm talking about here, but that if we do the kinds of things that I'm talking about here, we're not going to be saying as often uh, anymore, oh, th those were the un unintended consequences of the design that we, that we uh, actually put out there. Um, I think we need to spend way more time thinking about what could be the results of our designs. And one of my favorite uh, sort of design thinking techniques is called the pre-mortem, you know, where you have all the team that's super excited about the, 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 the design they just came up with. Um, and this is a common positive attitude that Silicon Valley uh, uh, startups have had all, for all these years. If you give them the pre-mortem, which is basically saying to them, okay, now imagine it's a year into the future and what you've just designed was a complete failure. It was just an absolute failure. What went wrong? Um, and actually imagining that it failed and then working back from that and saying, well, actually the, this could have happened or that could have happened. And then to build the mitigations into the design for that. That's even just one small example, but we just have to do way more of that rather than being so positive about, oh, this is gonna be great for the world to put it out there in the world and then see what the impact is. That's how we end up with all of these unintended consequences. And I think we need to be able to anticipate those with doing things like strategic foresighting and a lot of the other things that I'm talking about here as well. Uh, so the work that we're doing uh, is, uh, is basically to come up with a a framework of design curricula for the 21st century. Um, and we have an executive um, uh, committee that which is basically uh, Don Norman, uh, um, Meredith Davis uh, and I, and then we have this steering committee that I, uh, you see the picture uh, of all of the uh, contributors to it. Um, about half of them are educators, but half of them are, are uh, practitioners, um, are leadership, leaders of, of, of practitioner teams in, in companies and organizations. And then we have thus far uh, close to about 600 people that are volunteered to help with this. And you can still uh, uh, volunteer yourself as well, uh, either being a, a contributor to actually helping to write uh, and, and contribute directly to uh, the curricula that we're developing, uh, as well as uh, being a, a reviewer or even just staying up to date on what, what is going on. Um, but we have just completed four documents. Uh, one uh, is the, uh, the principles that should guide uh, design for the future, design education for the future. Uh, another one, the uh, topics that we think uh, should be in, uh, included in future uh, design education. Another one on student characteristics, that is characteristics that um, students uh, have today going into design or uh, 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 education, and also the characteristics that organizations um, would expect uh, on the other side of coming, the, the students actually graduating with those uh, characteristics. And then we also did a bunch of work on uh, sort of the pedagogical uh, uh, techniques uh, that should be considered in education as well. And so right now we're reviewing all of that and getting people's input, you know, on that uh, work. And then we're creating um, uh, working groups basically that are going to work on developing these, uh, uh, the content into uh, curricula and, and, and courses uh, as well. And all the way getting lots and lots of feedback, you know, on that. Um, and ask you to uh, join us in rethinking design education with this effort. I just wanted to, to reinforce 
uh, our language uh, about um, this work that I've been talking about. So we want to make sure that we're uh, that the future design education work will uh, focus on major societal issues facing the planet. Uh, I summarized a bunch of those. Um, we also want to make sure that we're accommodating all beliefs and perspectives, and also those who challenge those uh, perspectives as well. Uh, we've been openly uh, soliciting uh, people that have a different uh, point of view than the typical or traditional. And we also make sure, want to make sure we have a greater awareness of the you know, deterioration of economies and the environment and also even culture um, with uh, that, that, that has resulted from sort of colonization of the world. So there's a focus there too on making sure that we take a new fresh perspective, as I mentioned earlier, with a variety of other influences and cultures on um, the future of design and design you know, education. So with all of that, I thank you for uh, listening to me uh, during this uh, talk. And uh, uh, I think we're ready for some Q&A if uh, there are any questions that have come up. Well, thank you so much for this amazing uh, presentation. Um, so yeah, I mean, we have, we have some questions. Uh, I think that uh, some are referring to the challenges so the immediate yeah. challenges that, that 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 are happening right now, uh, and in, in getting sort of more practice-based content uh, in 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 this education. So, how would you recommend uh, so that more more practice-based content goes into the, into into higher education right now? No, really good question. And so, I think there is still a place for um, you know the the craft-based or practice-based sort of education that, that that is a foundation that, that's that's what we definitely need to be continuing to do um but i think what we need to do is um lift that up uh, to uh, also include these other perspectives that we're we're talking about so if you if you're a craft designer just as i the example i said uh, several times um that has amazing ability to be able to actually keep, keep people engaged on a, on a, on a web page, for example, uh, on let's say social media platform, um, and the organization and the company you work for just wants you to uh, design this thing in a way that that it it just uh, makes people glued to you know the uh, uh, that page, uh, and also you even work on other ways to be able to actually even bring up content that is even more similar to your views, and you know that might make you stay on that page even more. What I'm saying is that the craft skills that you're applying to that uh, situation, um, you need to balance with, you know, sort of the ethical and the other implications of that design as well, and to be able to anticipate what that is. So, so it's, it's, it's like um, uh, other disciplines that, you know, have codes of conduct, for example, and, and we may well need uh, one of those uh, for, for design, given the power that design has now, you know, where, you know, you do no harm, uh, you know, to use, you know, the Hippocratic Oath uh, out of medicine. Uh, I know architecture, you know, has, has one as well, whereas arch architects a lot of the time I read are not willing to work on the, uh, the architecture for um, some of the for-profit prisons in the United States, for example, because that's against their, their, their uh, oath of office, if you will. And so I think a similar kinds of thing we need to think about with regard to uh, design. So, is is a craft skill uh, not important anymore? It is important, but I think we need to balance it with these other perspectives as well. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the elements uh, that is not being talked very much about uh, is uh, the students right now. Mm -hmm. and the students, I think, the students are right now under under the most amount of pressure because, yep. especially midterm, they've had to to deal with a new, completely new reality. So, what are your recommendations? Uh, for easing some of the burden on the, on the students? A great question as well. And, and our COVID-19 design challenge actually had seven uh, how might we statements. And one of those how, how might we statements was how might we be able to, during COVID and working from home and studying from home, uh, improve the uh, educational experience. And it was interesting that uh, I think one or two of the uh, design um, uh deans that were part of it were actually making the observation of their own um, 
children at home, their, their university uh, age uh, children that were uh, working uh, now from home and realizing that uh, a couple of insights, you know, one was that they, uh, what they used to do uh, was they would be in classes and we'd be sitting bums in seats in a lecture theater, for example, let's the, not think about practical, uh, the practical courses right now, but, um, and they'd have to listen to lectures, right? And so what do they do now? They now have recorded lectures, which is even worse in terms of just sitting there and, and needing to watch this for, for uh, long periods of time. And what was interesting was the observation that um, the students were, were getting really distracted by a lot of other things that they have on their screens and stuff that was more interesting. Right. So you think, well, OK, do you either try to block out all of that or do you try to make the education itself more engaging and more interesting and, and, and the like? And so their whole that whole set of work groups that were working on that were saying, look, we need we need to up the 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 quality and the engagement uh, of edu education, but we also need to design it for the students themselves and the environment that they're in right now. And I, I'm I'm totally floored by this. But I, I've got uh, two sons at home still that are doing you know university education uh, from home, uh, and I'm I'm surprised that little or anything has changed in the way that the uh, classes are being done. And also the even the expectation of how much work is going to be uh, expected, you know, of the students as well. Mm -hmm. um, I should tell you about that, that um, at IBM, we took a um, working from home pledge, our, our, our design team uh, uh, actually created this, and then the whole company, uh, everybody started to post, you might have seen this on LinkedIn, of people taking the work from uh, home pledge, which uh, really tried to empathize with the ways in which people are actually working, you know, at home and how we should change and how we should be more understanding of the fact that there's all this other activity going, going on. There might be times when you don't want to be camera ready, for example, there, there's all kinds of things like that, that we should be, if we're, at, and, and I would think that at least design education, we think of that, that empathy for the end user is really a fundamental of, of, of the way our, our, that we approach design. I think we need to go do the same thing for when we're doing design education and actually thinking right now about the ways that the students are actually experience this, experiencing this as well and factor you know, that into the education. And we also have to though empathize with the faculty that are doing this because <laughs> they need to also pivot. Okay. You know, Absolutely. you and I were just talking Absolutely. before we started about all the technology that we all, that you and I have both sort of brought in, but we also have to realize that this is an entirely different world that the uh, faculty need to go work through as well. So I, I, I'm not just dumping on or, or blaming faculty for not, you know, being uh, uh, more focused on sort of the end user uh, uh, experience, which is the, the student uh, in this case. I think we have to do the same thing with uh, faculty uh, as well. Fantastic, fantastic. We have a question here. Uh, do you worry at all about design overreach? If everything is designed, nothing is. So that was yeah. a, a sort of comment from I love that. I love that. I, I think that there's a, um, and, and it's important to still factor that in. I, 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 the way I would characterize it is what I said earlier, that I think design sensibility is valuable to almost anything that anybody is doing. And you don't have to be a designer to do that. And that's actually how I would characterize the effective use of design thinking. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense mm -hmm. for any organization? Let's take the, the people that I teach uh, in, uh, that are board directors of, of, uh, of organizations. Well, so is it makes sense for them to understand the organization and the the clients let's say of that organization well should they actually even understand the management of the organization that they are governing you know effectively yeah <laughs> and and the, so these kinds of methods i think are just i think core to the way that we can improve the world period I don't think that's design over, overreach. I think that's that's. But but when start when people start to think, and I did actually have a I did a talk at a university, and it was an interdisciplinary talk, and uh, I had one of the senior people out of the business school say, "Oh, but when now that we're all using design thinking, do we still need designers, Carl?" <laughs> I said, "Whoa, thanks for the question." 
damn it, yeah, <laughs> we'd still need uh, designers, of course, to do the design. You know, design think is not doing design. It's just doing, it's just a collaborative, a, a set of collaborative methods to be able to get people to think about um, collectively what it is that they're uh, trying to accomplish and using a design sensibility, if you will, to do that, you know, collaboratively. But do you still need visual designers, user experience designers, user researchers, uh, content designers, and all the rest of it, uh, um, uh, industrial designers. Absolutely. Uh, that doesn't mean that that, that lessens at all the, the, the need we have for those. But I, I wouldn't say that it's design overreach if we're saying that, like I said, that a designer needs to think about the implications of their design and to be able to actually have the knowledge of, of uh, the broader perspective that their design is going to, to, to uh, be able to provide. I mean, we, we have a notion in the, uh, this uh, Future of Design Education uh, project uh, where we're looking at um, sort of tier one and tier two sort of uh, skills. Uh, and what we're basically saying is that, um, and again, this is evolving. So we're, we're, people are, can challenge this stuff and we're, we're going to be able to, you know, sort of react to the challenges because nobody has all the answers. But the thinking here is to say that for a tier one set of skills, I don't think that uh, it's appropriate to only be teaching the core craft skills, for example, as mm -hmm. tier one. Uh, I think every designer needs to come out with a knowledge of some of these other things that I'm, uh, I'm talking about, just so that we we get the positive impact that I talked about earlier, not the negative impact of the power of design. And so I think that's not overreach. That's more us as a, as a discipline, um, taking the appropriate responsibility for the power of our discipline is the way that I would put it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Another question that we have, should design education be compulsory like maths? Yeah. Interesting question too. I, I think, I think design thinking education done right uh, may well need to be. Um, and that's sort of the approach that I've taken with some of the, my teaching that I've done over the last five years. And people have come back to me that have been in a variety of other disciplines coming back saying, you know what, the best course that I ever took <laughs> that, that, that is helping me in my day-to-day -day life is in fact the innovation by design course that, 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 that they took. And so I think there is a value to, again, the the way I like to characterize it, uh, design thinking is that it's designed sensibilities. It's not learning. To, it's not design. Uh, and we have to hammer that uh, uh, idea home. But having, you know, a notion of you should probably empathize and understand other people. Mm, that might be something yeah. that everybody, yeah. you know, in this political climate. Well, basically, <laughs> we, should encourage, right <laughs> we should encourage all kinds of thinking, not just design thinking. That's right. That's right. In, and it really, in education. Yeah, and it's it's critical thought. It's but but I think there are some things about the design sensibility, about the notion of really deeply understanding somebody else, you know, and and authentically listening to them and understanding them alike, that is a skill everybody should have. Well, it's it's also core to doing design well, um, but it's also one that, that that's relevant to you know everybody. Uh, in no matter what walks of life. A, another example, I teach, I teach a course to uh, medical students, uh, sort of me medical school students and early uh, um, uh, physicians early in their career. And they learn all the craft stuff, mm. right? Uh, and, but they don't learn the bigger perspective. Like when they are, are they're going to set up their office, you know, mm. let's now make it, you know, patient centered. Yeah. What might be on the patient's mind, you know, th them coming in, especially these days, even with COVID, how do, uh, what, what kind of worries would people uh, have? How, how should they design that? Even, even hospital clinics are virtually never designed with the patient in mind. Everything is, is optimized for, for the staff. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. here's a case mm -hmm. too, where mm -hmm. the design sensibility is relevant Absolutely. Absolutely. To, the, to those skills, right? Now, are they going to be sketching some things out and, you know, pushing pixels or, you know, no, <laughs> but it's the, it's the framework of thinking that I think is appropriate. Fantastic. Fantastic. We have a question here. Uh, how do you find the scale works of these ideas in an organization? I guess your, the ideas you presented, how do you find the scale works uh, in an organization? Yeah, I think it's scaling something uh, is 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 difficult and and needs to be intentionally designed. <laughs> so uh, when we started this overall uh, transformation of, of the IBM company, 
um, I mean, we, we use design methods to design the actual approach to scaling, right? And which was, we first chose the top projects that were actually chosen by the CEO to work on. Um, and we purposely said, we're only going to do projects that we have sufficient numbers of designers to be able to do. So it wasn't just a matter of saying, okay, let's just take some designers and okay, they're going to have to work on five different products. No, we're going to have projects that have 40 designers on it because uh, that's his, the number that's required. And we're going to keep on adding designers and, and starting to do projects that, that uh, or additional uh, products and services or uh, uh, engagements based on, on sort of the, the number of people that we have. We also, I would like to also reinforce that we would also do um, basically pivot meetings. Uh, um, my boss never thought that, uh, he never uses that uh, term, but he does that. He's a serial entrepreneur. He always has this level of thinking. So once a quarter, our leadership team, our design leadership team would get together in an offsite you know, location and we would have what I would call a pivot meeting. What is going well? What should we amp up? Yeah. What What's not going well? Do we need to correct it or do we need to kill it? All right. And so, and there's no reason why a 109 year old company uh, that has some, you know, 400,000 employees can't be agile and can't change quickly. There's no reason mm -hmm. it can't. Mm -hmm. It's just, you need the, the right mindset. So the right, right mindset with, uh, that Phil Gilbert, my boss brought in was this notion of we can pivot. You know, and yeah. so we would pivot as an example, we, we hired a lot of visual designers uh, and UX designers early on. And then we realized, no, we really aren't doing sufficient work on really understanding the user research and life. So we hired a bunch of user researchers. And then we looked at, um, we now have had amazing things in the Adobe uh, 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 tools um, that look beautiful and work really well. And then when, when the product was actually built, it was like, oh my God, this is not what it was in the mock-ups. <laughs> uh, and we realized that what we were missing was skills in front-end development, right? Yeah. So we realized that we needed to hire a whole lot of those people. So we, in a for a quarter or two, we, we, we changed our whole hiring strategy to hire um, front-end developers. So, so to scale, you have to intentionally do it. You have to constantly look at what's going well, what's not going well, and be able to actually pivot, you know, as you go. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much for, for, for your time and for this fantastic uh, presentation. And we're looking forward to keeping in touch uh, with your projects. Will thank do, you. for sure. Thank, thank you, you for the invite and I wish you all the best with the rest of the sessions. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you. All thank you. Bye. Bye now. Well, that was a fantastic uh, keynote speech. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to continue our forum uh, with uh, Dr. Ari Chand. He's going to talk to us on symbolic violence and the importance of inclusive design stories. So over to, to Dr. Ari. Hello and welcome to my uh, talk for uh, VDEF 2020. My name is Dr. Ari Chan. I'm a lecturer of visual communication design at the School of Creative Industries at the University of Newcastle. And I acknowledge and respect the Pambalong clan of the Awabakal people, the traditional custodians of the, of the campus of which the University of Newcastle is situated and recognise their continuing connection to the land, uh, waters, culture, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, I'll be talking about symbolic violence and the importance of inclusive design stories. So taking from respectful design and the values of inclusivity, people's cultures and the ways of knowing. Design education needs to decolonize and start thinking about alternative and dominant um, storytelling when it comes to teaching students how to navigate this complex world. Socio-cultural reproduction reinforces systemic issues of representation and viewpoints. And the conceptual frameworks around this are really important for how we use speculative thinking into the future, uh, how we think about history and futurology and how they have a shared affinity. They are both the children of a moving present. So looking back teaches us ways of thinking and how do we create these critical fictions in the processes of deconstructing the power of the 20th century and how modernity is half of the story and coloniality is the other hidden half. 
Uh, so how can reproduction of a colonial matrix affect us? And especially here in Australia, how do we unlearn those behaviours of design education in order to relearn what design means for us? Uh, and our area. So if we start to take the presupposition that the contemporary world uh, can be considered a massive design failure, um, how do we start to think about moderns and non-moderns and how they uh, develop things for the future? In order to decolonize an actively future, visual communication design as soft power has the ability to manifest symbolic violence within the tensions of cultural production. So it's evident in a more globalised and visually mediated world that visual communication across journalism and reportage, education and knowledge, transference, persuasive advertising and marketing, narrative fictions and entertainment is embedded across all of the human contexts of practice that students will be engaged, engaged with uh, as they move throughout their education uh, in whatever form that takes. And design is a way of being, and, and we need to think about this as we collectively move forward and how design has power in a post-human anthropocentric uh, world, uh, and how do we build new forms of pragmatism deeply connected to communicating and influencing collective ideas. And visual communication design is a highly influential form of soft power, uh, and this brings us to an important point of recognising dominant Western narratives that have uh, been present in, in uh, design education in institutional senses, and that we still want to build the polymathic philosophy of history and epistemology and all of these different things within students' thinking, but the socio-cultural stories we keep telling large and small are also really important for how they may click and understand design. And how might things like Indigenous Design Charter or other uh, organisations thinking about decolonising design and telling stories help build and, think us to, and, and design students to think about how they negotiate the social, cultural, economic capital of them producing in the world, whether it be experiences or whether it be physical objects, and that the designer sees the world in order to be in it. So they must observe and engage the visual cognition afforded them, not only in a socially and culturally way, cultural way, but physically as embodied significance of moving through and experiencing things uh, and how we understand symbolic violence and, uh, and symbolic capital. So symbolic violence, to put it tersely, is simply as possibly as the violence which is exercised upon a social agent with his or her complicity. The history of design is often myopic and we have this deeply ingrained hierarchical thinking that hop happens in a utopian sense when we start to think about how these things come around and that every even the contemporary design use of the term user sort of dehumanises the process of engaging with one another. Uh, that utopian sense is also about giving voices to individual people uh, so that we can trace the history of the Bauhaus but also think about how it may have disenfranchised people and how students do that too so that we diversify not only how we're teaching but what we're teaching as stories. So what does design education do in this? Visual communication is as becoming in soft power. The students seem to use the culture medium knowingly, unknowingly, creatively and spontaneously throughout the design process. Uh, and that whether they're thinking about exposing dyslexia and how it might operate for someone moving through the world or developing a typeface like Christian Boa, that, that you're presenting these types of case studies and examples to students, whether they're working in an analogue or digital way, uh, that they, they're exposed to these processes of Excess, uh, making the icon for the disabled it more accessible, like Sarah Hendred and Brian Glennie, exposing these stories to students and that they might be in their own uh, backyard, like here in Newcastle for me. How do we think about ageing and how that process of empathy building is really important for what they do and, and create in the world? Typefaces that work across multiple language systems and we develop multiple super families of scripts and, and uh, superscripts. Um, across languages? How do we start to use data information and visually communicate sort of myths around how storytelling works in these processes of, of police murders of black Americans uh, and using alternative ways of presenting information? How do we think about the stories of like mixed race people and not just having this uh, stereotype but the people of colour in general across the world having a voice and having stories? Uh, and using design research methods for mapping these experiences. We're using illustration like this example from Cecilia Flume, Flume, who was an adoptee to a Swedish family, using illustrations as a storytelling mechanism and showing these 
these examples to students or how the arrival of migrants and refugees to Europe was affected by creating interactive, uh, um, visually rich and vibrant um, and maybe using traditional techniques to communicate the story. This is an example from a PhD student here at Newcastle, Christian from Brazil, who looks at censorship within the Brazilian government and how visual communication has played such an important role in that people des people's designed experience. This is one of my past Indigenous students, Jasmine, um, and using her skills, her communication skills, to communicate how stories work for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia and believing that design can help those stories be enacted for people. Uh, thank you for listening to my talk. Uh, thank you. Hello and welcome to my Fantastic. That was a fantastic presentation from Dr. Arichan. Dr. Arichan is in the chat right now. So uh, there will be time for e-networking, I think. Uh, so, you know, you, you, the, watch, the, the viewers can um, be networking with each other on social media. Uh, so we're going to go uh, next to Alex Cameron. Why the graphic design canon matters. Hello everyone, my name is Alex Cameron. I'm a graphic designer, design writer and critic and a lecturer in graphic design and design history. Um, before I launch into the presentation proper, I wanted to give you all a chance to acclimatise to my accent. I'm told it can be, at times, quite impenetrable. Um, so I want to tell you a story to help you do that. Um, me and my family moved to Madrid a year and a half ago or so, um, and we had no Spanish. A rudimentary. Dothar vethas, por favor, and, and the likes. Um, but very quickly we realised that there were two um, reactions we would get to our uh, bad Spanish. One would be, People would just speak as normal or even throw their hands up and walk away because they weren't able to communicate with us. The other were people who uh, warmed to it, took it on as a, a challenge um, and after a little while were able um, to understand, uh, to get the basics, you know, uh, to be able to communicate on the most basic level. And I think it's important for this discussion, or the discussion of design and communications in general, um, that we realise that the, the, the audience for our work has to be receptive. Indeed, we have to meet them halfway. If we're to get the message across, if we're to engage, uh, with that audience, then we need to understand them as much as they need to understand us. Anyway, we need to talk about the canon. Not just in this forum, but in as many forums and platforms as possible. Because I believe that the attack on the canon that we can identify today is crucial to be de uh, uh, that we defend it. Um, because it's not just the canon, but the very concept of design and communication, our understanding, the public's understanding, that is at stake. The critics at present come in kind of two forms. One, is, or, uh, one would be those who argue that the canon needs to be decolonised, the central proposition is that the canon um, is a representative document of white supremacy and that non-white voices have been excluded. The other, for now, I'll call social designers, 
see the canon as holding all that is bad about design and want to reinterpret how we judge design in terms of what's good and what's bad. I think both these propositions uh, have, a, have a lineage that I'll go on to discuss later. I think these views are problematic largely because they misunderstand what the canon is. And this is how I would try and explain it. The canon doesn't come about through democratic vote. It is not decided by individuals. Um, and arguably, it is only in part decided by the design profession. What I mean by that is, is that canonical works, movements or individuals are so because they've managed to break out of the design profession as such and have managed to influence other areas of life. So for example, business, culture more broadly and the public when they are touched by canonical works, react, interact and engage with them to such an extent that be they become part of broader culture. To put it another way, canonical works transform through impact our profession, how we understand it, and how we practice it, they are often revolutionary in how they change how we design. So, of course it's important for the profession, but more so, it's important to recognise that business, wider culture and the public are also transformed through canonical works. They both impart and receive um, and together um, the canonical work floats to the surface. So as I'm saying I don't believe canonical works are just plucked out of thin air. It's not a popularity contest. Um, and it's not just simply works that make, uh, are visible. Um, impact is crucial. Impact in the profession, how we practice and how we understand our world. But also the impact that they have outside of it. So for me, that understanding of the canon suggests very strongly that it's not a case of picking and choosing what should and shouldn't be canonical works but accepting through observable reality and materiality that canonical works are not just our work but the work of others. With this in mind it's both unsurprising and surprising at the same time that the canon should be under attack. I mentioned um, people who want to decolonize the canon as much as people who want to um, reinterpret what good design means. To really get a handle on this moment, we have to understand, I believe, that this attack has been 50 years or so in the making. Uh, the design leadership, um, the design elite have for a generation turn, been turning their backs on what I believe is fundamentally the role of design in society and want to reconfigure it in such a way as to rob it 
of what um, is at its heart, which is a universal impulse. I think one area of um, um, a problematic area of the last 50 years is how many leading designers um, have turned against what was termed consumerism. The problem is the anti-consumerist rhetoric of the 70s and 80s very quickly became anti-consumer. So the historic dynamic role of design and the relationship, the tripartite relationship between designer, client and audience began to be dismantled. That dynamic relationship was reconfigured to such an extent that today the designer, it is argued, is the arbiter of what should be um, and what is good and bad. The client, if they fall outside this ethical framework, is to be cast aside. More importantly, the audience is no longer seen as a participant in the design process, but is now seen as a static uh, object that is to be told how things are. So, the way I understand this is like this. Who decides whether design is good or bad, ultimately? I think it's the public. The public's engagement with designed objects or pieces of design communication is crucial, not only in their success, but in identifying uh, the relationship and role of the designer in relation to its audience. If we cut out the audience and see them as just passive observers, then all we're left to do is to tell them how to live, rather than recognising that dynamic relationship has a positive impact on how we design. So, the attacks on the canon, I believe, are not of design, but come ideologically outside of it. I believe at its root, the problem of attacks on the canon are located in a rejection of the public and a rejection of the belief uh, in the public as active participants in the design uh, process. For me, the canon is for everybody. It's indisputable. I understand that some people who suggest they don't see themselves in the canon I understand that idea because nobody does see themselves in the canon. But we must situate ourselves in the canon. We must situate ourselves among the best in order that we can learn from it. No, the canon is not exclusionary. Indeed, arguably the canon is the best expression of the positive impact of universality. It is demanding of an ever greater and broader audience and demanding of an ever greater um, uh, engagement with that audience. The canon speaks of the best of us, our dynamism and impulse to understand and communicate, to understand the world and communicate with our peers. If we can sign the canon to the dustbin of history, we will do that at our peril. The last point I want to make is, as often as a, it often appears, that critics of the canon come across as radical outsiders or progressives. 
And I think this is to fundamentally misunderstand the location of the problem. Critics of the canon have bought into and promote an elite, an elitist ideology that says that the designer is God and that the public are there to be cajoled and uh, told what to do and what to think. So I think this is a very simple uh, collision between two fundamental ideas. One sees the public as part of the process, the other sees the public as to be um, um, uh, 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 told, talked to and cajoled. One is an active agent, the other is an empty vessel. Now I know this has been a broad sweep, um, which is only possible in 15 minutes. But I think if we were to boil it down to three points, it would be this for me. The canon is a necessary teaching tool for academics, students, practitioners, and the public more broadly. Attacks on it are ideologically constructed outside of design. So finally, my argument, I guess, is this. For educators, our job is not to tell students the answer. We know this. Our role is to facilitate critical minds, independent minds, Minds that will go out and understand and achieve through engaging with the public. Not seeing themselves as godlike creatures. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. Well, thank you very much to Alex Cameron. Uh, next up, next, our next speaker is uh, Schalk van Staden, Cosmosing uh, Design Education. So over to Schalk. Hi, I'm Skol van Staden. I'm all the way from South Africa and I'm a design educator. I work for Tswana University of Technology and I'm a lecturer in integrated communication design. So, let's start. Today I'm going to talk about design education from a different light, which is a cosmological one, to unpack the notions of tacit knowledge, epistemologies of design, and the social, to relook the processes of design education, positively impacting on design educators and students. First, let me explain cosmosization, that in this case should be understood as seeing the individual as an eccentric observer and interpreter of the cosmos. Evidently, the term cosmos is a broad and complex one. The term can be traced back to the period between 600 and 450 BC, where it refers to the first scientific revolution, where a group of Greek philosophers questioned the way in which people viewed and understood the natural world. I shall refer to Latour's framing of the concept as a structure in which society is the matrix within the social sciences, politics, the individual and technology coexisting in a network. Insights into the relationships between the elements within this matrix as a kind of gathering point is crucial. One then thinks of society therefore being constituted through and of this dynamics of the relationships and the concept is not limited to refer to a mere numerical collection of people, but rather understanding what it is to be human, which is to understand the social and society where the cosmos includes diverse elements relating to humans, but also the relationships they have with their life world. So looking at the social paradigm as a networking of relationships, the term cosmos in turn is used 
here to refer to the common world, meaning our everyday life, an interplay between human and non-human actors. And the notion of the cosmos is the construct of the everyday or common world that here is situated alongside theories of cosmopolitanism and branching theories of cosmopolitics. Cosmopolitics is not beyond politics, but that which allows questioning the common world by addressing aspects that relate and coexist. Such politics, in other words, cosmopolitics, comprise of a mode to better understand ourselves and those in contrast to ourselves. So the concept of cosmosization here is a stance formed from the intersecting concepts of cosmopolitics and the common or cosmos. To provide a sense of selfhood, learning to know oneself immersed in the everyday through the cultures of others. It is a lens to look at reality from a holistic relational perspective and enables a process of creating reality, cosmosizing reality in order to create an environment filled with meaning. Philosophically, epistemology is defined as a theory of knowledge. In this case, within the field of the philosophy of design, Epistemology refers to a distinct knowledge praxis. A design knowledge not always reliant on knowing what the final outcome of a design will be, but rather one that interrogates the conditions of formation of design knowledge. As such, this epistemology of design is concerned not only in knowing the facts about or knowledge of design, but also with the individual dynamics between people to foster a metacognitive awareness of design knowledge, which in turn will result in a su successful design outcome. Its epistemologies is to establish the usefulness of the latter of design practice and for each designer. Design is designed for people and not things. The emphasis on the individual in design highlights the notion of experientiality. This experientiality signifies the meeting places formed by the relationships between the individual, the social, the cultural, deep social structures and space. This will lead to unpacking these relationships to clarify an already existing complex matrix, which is the common, that might refer here then to a framework of critique of the epistemology of design. From an experiential design point of view, the epistemology of design currently resides within a predominant modernist paradigm. This current modernist classification in design practice is more linked to the object than the individual or to the social pract practices and spatial matrix within which the individual is co-immersed. The field of the philosophy of design in this instance has not yet been investigated from this perspective of cosmosization, which it ought to, to have a relook at the design practice and knowledge as a whole. In terms of design education, one has to reflect on a deeper investigation of design to unpack the discipline as a whole, which means one has to reflect on the difference between the philosophy of design from design philosophy. A simple distinction would be to say that one can conceptualize the philosophy of design as ingredients of a final product and then design philosophy as the theory of cooking. So we will have to investigate what these ingredients are, not only in terms of their meaning and understanding, but then see how these relationships between the ingredients are formed to be able to constitute something in terms of a design being worthwhile. Design practice has changed with the advent of technology, stressing the need for a metacognitive awareness of design knowledge. Such an awareness would include the assessment of the actions and experiences on successful design outcomes. However, this success may be defined as each new social or design development necessitates a realignment of its principles of good design. But understanding the importance of the relationships between man and machine, the space of interaction between the individual and object designed is at the center of good design. Realizing the importance of the space of interaction experientially will make it clear how people act, think, behave, respond and interact with the objects designed. In design practice, this means that first, a good understanding of people and their needs have to be established. And experience is paramount, especially in the case of design, establishing how fondly or distastefully things have been designed. Going back to design education and looking at higher education institutions, we can see that there are many schools of design that centers their education around core design principles and traditions that then later focus on challenging ideas of specialization. Advanced courses even within their structure 
is where the epistemology of design still is seen in a modernist classification, focusing on the object and the spatial attributes of the human and non-human relationship within design are not considered. And this consideration of challenges that need to be addressed sometimes are then overlooked when the social dynamics and networking relationships between individuals and their space of design for and by them are not reflected on. Systemic performance, contextual and global challenges in design that have to be discussed and dealt with in design curriculum, I suggest have to be looked at as well. That I then frame within an analogy of a spatial cookbook. If we then think of a cookbook, we then have recipes, ingredients and how-to processes. So we can think of recipes as the designer and or of the context of design because it provides a variety of diverse indications of different roles of the designer, different contexts of design within the discipline from the principles around design tapping into different avenues thereof. The ingredients can then be seen as the social, political and economic because it provides the different entities within society that interlink with one another whereby one is made aware of how different entities are understood through becoming aware of their relationships with one another. The importance of politics within design and the importance of the economy, its interrelatedness within the social dynamics of a society that educates a cultural reflection of the self within such a space that as a whole reminds of an ontological reflection of entities relating to one another, signifying unpacking of being, the being of artifacts and of people, again, is that of a human and non-human relationship. Then the how-to process is seen as a practice of design, technology and the epistemology of design, because this is where the skills of design come together in a medium, cognitive and technical skill to be able to understand a process of design, taking together recipes and ingredients to develop successful, good design and designers. This is all found within the spatial spheres, within the social that cannot be shaped without understanding and reflecting on the human component. This means we are cosmicizing the role of design, the design practice and that of design education as a whole. In doing so, we are cosmicizing design education, going beyond the traditional means of educating and understanding the process and application of design that at the end of the day remains tacit knowledge but rather take the approach to understanding the metacognitive awareness of the epistemology of design, individual Im involvement and place within society, experientially part of social dynamics towards shaping not only sensitized individuals and designers, but allowing dialogue to be formed. The problem, even before lockdown, is that dialogue within design and design education was lacking. Now in lockdown, the problem is the very means of using technology and online platforms to teach design. One cannot rely on technology to educate designers about design by means of developing technical skills, soft skill and theory that all have to interlink with one another in a practical forum. The very nature of design practice is informed by theory and also informs theory that in some way can be transferred through online means but it will leave out the practical component. Technology and being online takes away the true meaning and process of dialogue that is very needed in design and design education. It sensitizes conversation. It predetermines a conversation because the very act of being online, giving a lecture is preset and constructed that does not allow for the engagement in true form with participation within an audience and students in a studio. The importance of dialogue cannot be overlooked, especially in the studio practice. And as far as online goes, we'll never be able to overturn the traditional studio practice because it is there where the engagement with the medium, knowledge and development of skill are not predetermined. As one listens and comprehends certain information, all of a sudden one develops new insight or it sparks a question about a subject matter in design that won't necessarily have come to life watching a lecture online or listening pre-structured lesson online. It is not to say that the education practice outside being online is not planned. It is very planned, but it allows scope for further development outside the boundaries of the limits of the platform of technology. It allows for engagement of hands-on in-studio participation where different cultural insights and experiences come together from students and lecturers to remold greater knowledge about that which is being taught within the studio environment. This space 
of engagement, the experiential understanding of knowledge and skill becomes that much more richer than behind the screen. Yes, there is currently a strive towards blended learning, online and offline teaching, which is understandable and good, yes, but the curriculum needs to be very clear about what understanding will be attained of design on which platform because there remains a need for foundational skill in design. One cannot rely on technology alone to develop design skills and knowledge, especially if one wants to avoid such knowledge to remain tacit. In other words, in some instances, one will have to go back to pencil and paper, understand the traditional mediums, learn the representational qualities with one's own observational skill to then later transfer into technological languages. And it is at this stage where one is to realize how one will continue the dialogue of a cosmosized design education between the individual, the social and the design practice to further develop not only the dialogue of design within the design discipline, but the dialogue holds about the social politics and the space they are in. And with design being political, its politics needs to be expressed, but the foundation has to be set. Wanting to develop sensitized citizen designers, as educators, we will have to sensitize them about a deeper understanding of social issues, human behavior and new ethical challenges they need to respond to in a global society. We have to make sure that design education allows for an experiential relation towards worldly issues, relooking the context of blended learning to allow a physical doing, the actual practice of design, dialogues being introduced and shaped, experiences expressed and investigated, all within the studio environment amongst other students and designers. The experientiality of design needs to come across in design education by cosmosizing it, not allowing technology to overshadow the development and teaching of technical skill, but rather to be a means to enhance the prowess of knowledge gained. So the knowledge and skill obtained by students need to be applied to real life situations, needs, concerns and desires of people, society and the social. The more real and hands on their design practice becomes, the more ready they will be for industry. The design curriculum must move away from how pretty it looks on paper and focus really on establishing strong foundations of core design skills and knowledge that include traditional drawing and illustration practices dialogues, critical thinking, human-centeredness, cosmologically reformulated epistemologies of design, integration of social and political ties, working processes and networking, practice research, and not be fooled by the showmanship of technology and being online. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Schalk, for this uh, incredible presentation. Uh, now we are going to listen to Rosina Spinoi, Inclusion with Design and Creativity. So over to Rosina now. Hi, my name is Rosina Spinoi. I'm a designer and a social entrepreneur based here in Brussels. Today I wish to talk about inclusion with design and creativity and why we should also teach design education and critical thinking skills to our schools. Designing inclusive processes, places and projects to nurture that creativity and critical thinking skills in education and beyond is incredibly important. Now we know creativity and play also is important for emotional development, for the social skills, looking at the world in a different lens, which creates also that happiness and joy, as well as leading to innovative thinking and ideas. There are various studies out there, including the Lego Foundation, neuroscientific studies emphasising how play activates the brain in meaningful ways, including engagement of creating joy. The prefrontal cortex of the brain also shows up with the positive effect that enables many higher cognitive functions. Dopamine levels also increase, creating positive emotion which regulates the reward, pleasure and emotions in the brain.
With encouraging critical thinking and teaching this, we would be enabling our students to really assess their learning styles, their strengths, their weaknesses, to really take ownership of their education also. Also to work across different disciplines, really enhancing their performance or academic performance with a little bit of design thinking and imagining what the future could be like, especially with knowing that the wicked challenges we have today will probably not be going away soon. I'll be sharing some of the projects I have had the pleasure to co-design with students, including this one. How can we connect again in this technological, fast-moving world that we're in? What can I do to make the world more safe and secure? What can I do to connect again? This is something that really concerns me, but also makes me incredibly passionate to do something about it. Looking at the diversity, this city is made of so many different colours of people, so many backgrounds. It's amazing. Complete mix, it's a melting pot. This fascinates me. About how people connect with each other. How can we all feel a part of the community that we're in? Linking creativity, linking technology, but still having the human contact together. I decided to use my creativity, my network, and design a project that's about inclusion, and it's about inclusion for children like Harris, to come together and have this fun, create, interact with the different digital tools that we have, the digi different digital games that kids use, right through to the experience of 3D printing and touching, smelling, feeling the different materials and the different objects that they can make. It's called Analog to Digital and it's a creative workshop. This project was very close to my heart, with it being co-designed with my son, who's on the autism spectrum and has special needs, and with his friends in two amazing schools where we created a nurturing environment, empowering the children, and through the power of creativity and imagination, they had an amazing time, and it was an incredibly rewarding project for me. Another project was the Pocket Forest, where I mentored youth from three different schools in Slovenia with the help of a local lab. Via an EU project of the Do It Challenge, which encouraged children to think about a solution for climate change, with the youth designing a tool to measure air pollution. This, along with also posing the right questions to encourage to the children to think about product development, design, branding and also marketing. Also to encourage thought about public space and how furniture could be used and co-designed with participatory processes with the youth. Design education needs to be for all, be wholly inclusive and empower all of our youth to think about designing solutions for today and for tomorrow. I leave with an image of Yeyo Kasama, the Japanese artist who shows us we can nurture our imagination, design a world of polka dots, no matter what age we are and what challenges we face. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Rosina, for this uh, enlightening presentation. Uh, our final presentation before we take our coffee break and our networking break uh, will be uh, Kai Zhang, You've Got Mail. So over to Kai now. Hello, my name is Sai. I'm an associate lecturer at the University of the Arts London. Today, I would like to share with you a project exploring possibilities of teaching practice-based postgraduate art and design via emails. So let's get started. When I first started teaching, I hear my colleagues complaining about students on read their emails. With my intuition and my experience working communication design and brand strategy, I find this statement tickled my fancy. So I set out to find out if the sentiment is true, and if so, is there anything I can do about it? It is predicted that 306 billion emails are going to be sent and received in 2020, and this figure is set to increase year on year. 
and the prediction is made before the pandemic. And 20% of that traffic are emails sent and received in higher education. So it seems that a large volume of emails are being sent and received at our institutions, and students made up most of our institutions, so it seems that perhaps it's not reasonable to say students generally don't read emails. A better question could be that why your emails are not read. Better still, if any and what are the possibilities of teaching practice-based postgraduate art and design via emails? And the stakeholders are postgraduate students, course administrators, course leaders, program directors, education developers, to senior and executive academic directors. But I think it is more important to understand the power of influence amongst the stakeholders. As you can see in the diagram here, students have the least decision power in how the curriculum is designed, how the course communication is delivered, and how they're being assessed, and the percentage of contact time they have with staff. So perhaps when you would like to see the behavior change among this body of people, it is not useful nor fair to allocate them the sole burden of change. Since students have the least power on how the course is communicated, how the teaching, teaching is conducted, I believe the focus of my research project should be on how to change the expectations and imaginations of those with more power, such as the tutors, the curriculum designers, the budget holders, the policy makers, people like you. The reason I think the project is important is not merely the novelty of using an overlooked medium to teach, nor I suggest it's a good idea to change all of our teaching and transform them onto emails. Digital technology is becoming part of our teaching and learning on postgraduate courses at art universities. It is worthy of our time and energy to challenge and understand our presumptions and expectations on the relationship we build with other humans while using these tools. With such insights, we could then use our imagination and intuition to build a better teaching and learning experience for all involved. In the time we have together, I would like to share some top-line learnings and reflections on the possibility of using email as a site of teaching and learning. I hope you could find this talk gives you a foundation to begin your own exploration on the topic. Here are some of the key methods used in this small action research project. Here are some of the key presumptions I've discovered. All students have email access at all time. This implies they have access to a network communication device and access to internet at all time. Students do not have competing professional, personal and care obligations while they're on the course. Students do not have as accessibility issues that prevent them accessing emails and this content, so they can, can capture all the information required for an action anticipated by the sender of an email. Staff has instant access to emails during office hours and days and choose not to respond to you. Staff have capacity to read all the email chains below your email. Staff would immediately understand why they're CC'd and BCC'd without explanation from you. Staff has same boundaries as you are when it comes to emailing on and during out of our office and days. My documentary research confirms that the email as a site of learning in arts and design higher education is underutilized and unimaginative. Belanded learning rarely position themselves from the perspective of the learner and is often a spectator sport. And for authentic learning to occur, learners must be engaged in an inventive and realistic task that provides opportunities for complex collaborative opportunities. I have also discovered that Conservatively, spam email costs academia worldwide $1.1 billion a year, and about 7 tons of carbon dioxide a year is emitted. And these figures do not count emails that that's been cc'd and replied all needlessly. So bearing this in mind, I have designed a small 14-day intervention. 12 postgraduate students from various London-based ask graduate schools participated. By signing up, they have agreed to answer an email around 6 p.m. each day, and the email had only one question, how did your workday go? To this, they're invited to pick a value between minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2 as a response. At the end of the 14-day period, they will be given back a documentation of the fluctuations of their assessment. Most of the participants would have a tutorial at the end of the 14 days period. They're invited to use this information to aid their session. Here are some of the top-line learnings. 
Participants unanimously agreed that email intervention was productive towards their ongoing reflective practice as part of their course study. Participants unanimously agreed the process revealed vital information on their inner dialogue and attitude on productivity. The four participants out of the twelve that only participated for ten days expressed the lack of patience for this kind of bi-weekly data reporting. One participant found it hard to see the point at the process of sign up, but participated anyway because it was not a hassle. From surveys and interviews, we have learned that there are some qualities of good practice that we all hold as important when it comes to email communication. And I have conducted a number of surveys and interviews with certain academic staff from very seniority to understand what they might be. And they are actionable. The information contained in email helps the receiver to move on to the next action and decision that is beneficial individually and mutually. Succinct. Not only the copy, but also the format and the greeting are uncomplicated. Connection. The receiver wants to connect with the sender through the content. They want to feel the sender thought about their needs and well-being between the lines. Acknowledgement. Receiver likes to see good deeds and good news recognized, even though it doesn't concern them. Precise, the information contained it has to be exact. Concise, no prose. Bullet points are the best. So what have we learned? We have learned that ubiquitous doesn't equate to inclusive. Just because everybody are expected to have access to email, it doesn't mean they, they can. Emails might feel disposable, but people's times are not. And give respect before you take. You can always co-create and review your communication boundaries with your students and colleagues. Students are not perpetrators of bad email communication on your course. It's not about fixing them alone. Emails have carbon front too. Email exposes cybersecurity risks to both staff and students. And for me, there is definitely an appetite for students to accept email as a site of learning. So as it caused the imagination of the educators to take the lead. And there are a number of limitations on this project, and some of them are listed here. And the project was unfunded, so there are limited time and capacity I could spend on this. However, I do believe the importance of the project, especially given the context of the pandemic. Many of you might find out, as I do, that video conferencing is not a replacement of in-person teaching. We have to really think about all the tools we have and negotiate their position within an interaction hierarchy so that we could use our time and energy wisely and effectively until we meet again in person. The next slide concerns a bibliography and suggested citation for this talk. Thank you for your time and curiosity, and I'm grateful for the platform at the Valencia Design Education Forum 2020. I hope you're able to stay safe and healthy wherever you are. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you to Kai Zhang for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, so now we're going to take a 30 minutes break. Uh, so you can network, you can have coffee, you can have, uh, you know, just rest, off, off screen time. And we'll be right back here in um, half an hour, in 30 minutes. Okay, see you then.
And we're back after the the break. I hope everyone had a had a good uh, break. Uh, so now we have uh, five, four, four, four speakers because uh, our last speaker was uh, is unavailable. Um, we have four more speakers before the panel. So uh, all the panelists should have received by now the new link that I have just emailed. And now we're going to have um, Peter Bella and Amanda Horton redesigning her story, a documentary for 2022. So enjoy that. Thanks for joining us for our presentation on Redesigning Her Story, a documentary film on women of graphic design in America. I'm Peter Bella. I'm an assistant professor in graphic design at the Department of Art and Design at the University of Central Arkansas. Hi, I'm Amanda Horton, or Mandy Horton, and I teach at the University of Central Oklahoma, where I primarily teach history of graphic design classes. So the reason this topic of women in graphic design became really important to me and I had a, uh, a big interest in it for me was over the years of teaching history of graphic design, which I have taught um, on and off for 11 years in my academic career. Uh, I've had a lot of people in class, a lot of students in class come to me and ask me, well, why isn't there more information about women in graphic design? We, you know, study a little bit about the Glasgow girls, we study a little bit about um, a little bit about C.P. Pinellas. We learn about Paula Shear, and you know that's kind of where the text just kind of has most of the information. Other than that, it was fairly fairly thin. So, unfortunately, what I had to really tell students was, well, there's nothing on women in graphic design that's cumulatively put into into one place where we could find that information. So their best bet was to do as much research on their own as possible. And there was plenty of information about women in graphic design, but it was dispersed through so many different locations uh, and resources that they really had to go out and kind of gather that information. So this became a big interest to me. And the, the, the original objective, which is no longer um, the objective that we're on currently, was to just kind of create a collective resource where there was one place that talked about the women in graphic design over history. And uh, we are speaking about women in graphic design in America. But uh, what, what the original intent was to try to find a way to document that and put it into an interesting story to tell that story. Um, but from our research, which we'll talk about here shortly, we've discovered that that original intent, although as great of an idea that it that it is, there was so much more to the story and so much more that people really wanted to know. So that's what kind of you know, got my interest going, um, and it, the story really kind of took off from there. So along a similar lines to Pete, um, I had found that there was just not enough information and resources about women graphic designers in, in history textbooks. So um, I started a, a project on my own. Um, it's a podcast called Incomplete Design History, which is intended to feature stories um, from graphic design history that are not often covered in the textbooks. And the first season was intended to be on women in graphic design history. So um, so when I started talking to Pete about this project, it just really seemed that both of our goals were aligned. Um, so it just made sense to come on board and that I could use the research I was doing for the podcast to also um, dovetail in nicely to what we were going to do with the film. So having uh, Mandy join me on this journey for the documentary film has been uh, nothing but uh, amazing and welcoming at the same time. Um, when I first started the endeavor, I was really excited to, to get going on the project. I quickly found out, though, as I was trying to dig into uh, research and the discussion and look for uh, people that had information that knew other people that had information because a lot of the stuff that we found out we needed to talk uh, talk about and the people we needed to talk with um, it was a it was a pretty big endeavor in trying to make those connections and I realized that also from my perspective being mostly a studio professor uh, with my graphic design classes and then teaching history of graphic design you know as um, a third course that I quickly realized that 
the importance of a historian in telling the story was critical. Um, a colleague of mine said that I should reach out to speak with Mandy. And uh, when I when I looked into um, Mandy's teaching and her background and and realized um, how how ingrained she was into this subject, it it, it seemed like a no brainer. So. Uh, I was a little bit nervous. I, you know, I'll definitely tell you that. So when reaching out and eventually connecting with Mandy and Mandy's excitement about coming on to the project, um, again, was nothing but amazing and welcoming. And with Mandy's assistance as not only a design historian, but a female design historian and uh, being aware of some different folks like Ruki Newhold Ravakumar, and I hope I said that name correctly, um, you know, and getting us in touch with some of the people has been uh, a very important aspect um, to our research. And it was those connections and those discussions that led us to realize that this film needed to be a lot more than just, um, you know, pardon the phrase, documenting the women in graphic design, but we needed to tell their story. We needed to tell her story for women graphic designers. So, um, as Pete mentioned, the original plan was to really just document women in graphic design history from America. Um, we were going to shoot a, a short film, um, maybe about 12 to 15 minutes over the summer 2020, um, traveling to New York City and Baltimore and Washington, D.C. to meet with several contacts up there for filming. Um, but as many of you are aware, the coronavirus hit and the pandemic shut everything down um, and put a halt on this project. But luckily, we were able to pivot um, into recording a podcast as um, as part of Pete's podcast, um, Design Dedux. So with the coronavirus changing our course of plans, we realized that we couldn't make that documentary short and that documentary short was going to be a critical component to further our research and a, a big big part of our funding to do the documentary film uh, i don't know if anyone has, has has ever looked into the cost of documentary films and uh what the investments take and yeah there's documentary films that are done under very small budgets and shot on iphones even uh, the documentary film that we were looking to do and the endeavor that we were looking to do, we estimated, and that estimate, that estimate in the beginning was actually rather low. We estimated somewhere around forty to sixty thousand, but as we're looking into it now, it's going to be more around the sixty to eighty thousand or or beyond. So, um, that documentary short was a critical component to moving forward with this uh, endeavor in the documentary film redesigning her story. So. What we did, as Mandy mentioned, was we had the podcast uh, platform. I have had Design Dedux, which is Creating Success in Design Education, a podcast that I've had um, going on its uh, almost into its second year now. And uh, we realized that, and we had a lineup of, of um, female designers, female educators, historians, students, uh, practitioners, all ready for us arriving with our film gear and doing those interviews, we reached out to each one of them and asked them, well, with what's going on, are, are you willing to pivot with us and shift into this virtual uh, online meeting style interview? And we're, we'd love to use that, that um, content that we get from that research and that discussion as material to kind of one, gather information that's going to be important to the film and important to our organization of, of content and topics and the discussion, but as well share that now as part of a, a way to start gaining some interest into, into that story. Uh, and that's actually been going really well. And we've had, um, I'm trying to do some quick math in my head. I think we've had approximately 14 different interviews. Uh, I don't know the exact number. It's, it's give or take. Um, but those interviews have gained uh, a lot of insight as to what um, redesigning her story, a documentary film on women in graphic design in America, really needs to have in it and not just become a collective place where we just talk about all the women in graphic design. 
through our interviews with the with the podcast Design Dedux, um, we interviewed people from the Smithsonian and the Cooper Hewitt specifically, and we interviewed um, you know well known graphic designers such as Jennifer Morla and Gail Anderson, and we interviewed design educators and design historians, um, Aggie Toppins and um, Louis Sandhouse and Brockett Horn and Briar Levitt. And we asked all of these individuals um, about their own work and their own research um, so that we could get an idea of what people were doing and what people were talking about in terms of women and their, their contributions to graphic design history. We all know from our history books and, and throughout time that graphic design or graphic arts uh, was a very male dominant industry, starting back with cold typesetting um, and the amount of um, uh, manpower that it took to set uh, cold type. And uh, there were a lot of women, not many, but a lot of women still in that time that really didn't get discussed, but it was still a, a dominantly male industry. But what we've noticed over time is that that has greatly shifted. And even now, as we look to the classroom, we can see that the numbers of male to female students is quite skewed and it's mostly a female student body in most um, universities that we have uh, been able to speak with different educators and we think that's a trend uh, across the United States. So another interesting thing that I think is going to be part of this film when we you know have those discussions and uh, begin putting things together from the cutting room floor is they say that we are going to find some interesting um, statistics on the amount of women that are graduating with graphic design degrees and going into graphic design careers versus entrepreneurs or small business owners that are women-run um, uh, graphic design agencies and firms. So that's been a, a really interesting part as well. And we don't want to talk too much about, um, you know, th some of these discussions that we've had because, you know, we would give up the film and then you wouldn't want to watch the film. So, um, you know, our, our findings are really, really interesting. And we have shifted definitely from that. Here are just women in graphic design and the great things they do. And we've also started to talk about this idea of notoriety and legends versus uh, the people that are out there every day doing it uh, as part of their their nine to five. As Pete mentioned, we've noticed this trend, um, and, and many of the people that we talked to as part of our research for the podcast has in, have indicated that they've seen this trend as well, where women are starting to dominate men in the classroom. And certainly there seems to be a shift in higher ed where very, you know, there are many, many female faculty members uh, at higher ed institutions, and they very often dominate over men in terms of numbers. Um, yet there is still a disparity in terms of leadership um, in, um, like, say, Fortune 500 companies, uh, major corporations where where there is a, um, a lead art director, but it's predominantly men. So as we look to continue on with this documentary film, there's a lot that we still have to do. Uh, Mandy and I have been researching so far for about a year. Uh, just about a year now, uh, and it's amazing how much material material we've gathered, but it's also amazing how much material we still need to gather. So some of our next steps is, well, one, we're looking for co-researchers, and we're uh, currently uh, compiling some names uh, so we can reach out to them, but we're looking for co-researchers in gender studies, women's studies, and sociology. Uh, and, and how those things relate to, um, to this story. Uh, the next thing that we have to do is, is think about the filming schedule. When can we actually get back out there and do some filming? Um, a couple of things that we're looking at, there is the possibility of doing social distancing with on-location filming. And as great as that is, one of the locations that has the majority of our um, interviewees is New York City in New York State. The situation there is New York State currently has a quarantine 
where if you travel into the state, you have to quarantine for two weeks straight before you can have contact with anyone else in the world. Um, so it makes it really impossible to schedule time to go out to New York City if we're just going to be in a room quarantined for 14 days. There's no way to do interviews. Um, so we have to look at the filming schedule and where the different interviewees are. We have East Coast and West Coast, New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, Colorado, Oklahoma, um, West Virginia, uh, and other locations, um, Seattle, Seattle, Washington, and some different places uh, across the, the West Coast. So we have to really kind of put together that plan on what's next. Another thing that we have to do is get the story out. We have to get the story out that the story is coming. Um, rather than just expecting this film to be completed and just gather an audience, it's going to be really critical that we start telling the story of redesigning her story uh, as soon as possible. We have a URL and a website that we're just starting to build uh, at the time of this conference. It's, it's, uh, it's live, but there's nothing built there yet. We do have social media accounts as well. And uh, those social media accounts I'll put at the end of the um, video part of the conference here that we're presenting. Uh, and we're building those slowly. I'm fortunate enough to have uh, in, um, a internship student that was able to intern with me to work on the film. So that's going to be really exciting. Plus, I have the opportunity to bring in a performance scholar, another student, to assist with some of those endeavors. So we're looking forward to getting some of these things rolling. So we encourage all of you to um, follow and subscribe to our different social media channels and spread the word support. Um, and as we as we post different things on our social media, it would be fantastic for you to keep in touch with us as well and give us comments on what you would like to see in this in this documentary film as well. Um, we think the voice of the viewer is the most important voice that we can have. So we want to bring you the information that you want to hear about about this story, which again goes back to my original concept of just bringing a collective together of great women graphic designers um, isn't enough. We really have to tell their story. So some of the topics that we plan to include um, are going to be uh, like main themes of archiving and documenting, uh, documenting how are, how are women um, archived and documented in history? How does that compare to the number of men that are archived and documented in history? Um, how does this, uh, you know, these things like, um, the idea of institutional credibility affect women um, and notoriety as well, awards, museum, placement in museums and galleries. Um, what does it take for women to get there? Um, and then also ideas about moving away from traditional or patriarchal approaches to archiving and documenting. Um, you know, how does this affect uh, women and their place in, in archives and in museums. Um, we are, of course, going to look at some of the historical figures. We'll, we'll hopefully talk to people about um, C.B. Pinellas, Elaine Lustig-Cohen, um, and then talk to active graphic designers today who are widely regarded, such as April Griman, um, Gail Anderson, Jennifer Morla, um, we also plan to look at people who might have been overlooked and forgotten throughout history, um, including even talking about this idea of an anonymous designer, um, designers who toil away in a firm as part of a collective who don't get recognized and what that means. We're going to talk about a woman's life in design, um, examining her journey into a career of design, things like education and opportunities that may have been available to men and not to women. Um, and of course, gender disparity there. We're gonna look at marriage and family life and how that affects women and their careers, um, the demands of motherhood or choosing not to be a mother, um, giving up a career perhaps to become a mother. Um, and then of course, uh, supportive roles, women who, who st stepped back and were supportive of men in their careers or, or women who had a mutual support system. Um, and then, of course, we'll talk a little bit more about disparity, um, more generally, gender stereotypes. Um, you know, why were there no women linotype operators or, or very few? 
um, and then did things like new technology, like photo typesetting, help break the gender barrier for for women. Um, looking at women in paste up and mechanical art or production artists, um, and then women in leadership roles today. Um, let's see, tokenism, what does it mean to be the token female? And then, of course, experiences for BIPOC women um, to not just be a token female, but to maybe be the token black female or um, Hispanic, um, what have you. And then finally, let's we'll probably look at what equality actually looks like and, and talk about how can we achieve that? Is it achievable? Um, and, and some ideas around that. Watch for um, the film to come out. Again, uh, lots of work that we have to do. We still have a lot of filming to do. And uh, we hope to have a couple um, small teasers that we can get out prior to the full release of the full length film. So um, yeah, follow us on the social media accounts, um, email us if you have any questions or interest, and we would love to speak with you at any opportunity. Thank you for joining us for our presentation. We hope that you enjoyed our conversation on redesigning her story, and we hope that you're looking forward to the release of the film in spring of 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter and Amanda, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we have three more speakers. Uh, next up is uh, Sanmitra Chitti, Understanding Design Management by Design Doing, a Pedagogical Approach. So enjoy Sanmitra's presentation. Hi, I'm Sanmitra Chitti. I'm the Dean at School of Management, World University of Design. And I must thank the organizers of VDEF for uh, letting me talk at this event. Uh, this is a wonderful event to talk about design and uh, doing by design. Uh, today I'll be talking about how to be apply doing by design into management principles. I take care of a design management college and we have formulated processes uh, through which students learn management principles via doing by design. I'll be giving a couple of examples. One will be of the entrepreneurship course that we take and the marketing course that we take. We see to it that students come up with a complete pilot project at the end of the course. Um, of course, yes, the generic management concepts are covered, the theory is covered, uh, design thinking as a theory is also covered, but how do they apply into, uh, into the project is looked into. They actually sit with a mood board, they come up with names, and the students finalize a name for their own pilot study. Now, this pilot study is of an entrepreneurial venture that they do at the end of the project that they are working on. Uh, they again now they uh, have collaborations across. They collaborate with the students of visual communication. They also collaborate with the students of product design. While doing so, they understand how do designers behave. They understand the psyche of designers. They also understand that if they have gone with a brief to be given to the designers, what should the brief contain? Because these continuous interactions uh, help them uh, help them learn what are the various pointers that they have to be adding in. They get their brand logo done and they put it up on display into the campus during this time. Uh, they come up with a date where the pilot study is happening and of course, now, uh, this goes without saying that they are working on the finances, they are working on uh, the project costs, they are working on, uh, on a project management structure that is being taught to them and the BOS also. And they work it together and the pilot study happens in the campus where they display their products. Now these products, specifically uh, if the group is working for a service, it is a service or uh, if they are working towards selling of some products, then those products are displayed. During these displays, it is seen to it that there is an external who comes in together and uh, makes it a point to be adding those products to their e-tail which is possibly available. Um, this helps the students gain that confidence to understand these various uh, processes across and also understand how do they apply design thinking into their projects. The pilot is then later studied with respect to getting the feedback from their professors and uh, also from their colleagues or probably the students who are studying with them, the fellows that they are studying with them and they understand whether their brand logo went well, whether the naming went, went well and whether they really uh, got some profit at the end of the pilot or not and 
they then project the pilot into how would they be uh, putting it across and on a bigger scale. Uh, based on this, one of our students has come up with uh, a project and has actually started his own entrepreneurial venture of press juices. I think this combination of collaboration of studies of design thinking along with students who are learning design and management together is always going to help uh, to understand both these processes. No one discipline can save the earth. So that is why we are looking forward to collaboration. And I think with this I made the point of how do you collaborate design thinking, design processes into management studies and management uh, theories that have been taught. With this I must again thank VDF and uh, yes I will be putting my email at the end of this talk uh, through which you can connect to me. Thank you so much. Fantastic. That was fantastic. Thank you, Sanmita. Uh, now it's uh, Take Home Lee, Tangible Type 1. So enjoy Take Home. Hello, uh, my name is Take Home, and I'm teaching graphic design at Iowa State University. Uh, today, I will talk about my research, a series of exploration with tangible type, and how it influenced my teaching. Designers can use a variety of printing techniques to produce visual materials and to solve visual problems. As 3D printing has become more refined, efficient, and accessible, what designers can do with the new printing technology? My research explores alternate design solutions using 3D printing. I've been experimenting with unconventional materials, such as ceramics and digital method to graphic design to create tangible type, graphics, and even designed objects. Especially, I infused 3D printing into my practice and have been working with clay. This one is writing love in cursive letter form with clay using my DIY ceramic machine. I built my own tools. My 3D printers are DIY machines based on open source plan. I'm a design maker. Uh, I'm a designer and a toolmaker. Technology and design have been in, in a symbiotic relationship. Typography has always evolved with technologies and creative processes as new technologies, processes, and materials fused new ideas and creative design solutions. These are ceramic type. As they were printed with wet clay, they shows the non-linear character of clay, as you can see. As they are printed with ordinary clay, they could be fired and glazed in kiln. Simply, they can be turned into the, they could be vitrified and become ceramics. I test their different languages: Korean, Chinese, Japanese, and even Arabic. You might ask why ceramics and typography. In terms of the history of printing and typography, ceramic is a meaningful material. We need a bit of time travel. Clay is one of the first material our ancestors used for typography around 3200 uh, 3, BC. As most of you know, this is a clay tablet and cylinder seals. It might be the high-tech printing method of the time. This is a 3D printed embosser. Uh, it's using the same idea as ordinary embosser. However, it has a modified mechanical system like a cylinder seal. Unlike today's dis digital printing, the embossing process involves a rich, tangible experience, which is more intuitive, fun, and memorable. As a user turns the roll, they can fully interact with the device. They can see the process and feel the paper is beaten as they turn the handles. This is my business, business card maker. I can print my business card anywhere, anytime, without ink. Not just ceramics, many material could be actually printable. I mean, 3D printable. It's one of the most exciting demos in my class, Nutella chocolate and peanut butter. 
they were printed, uh, 3D printed on bread bag. Yes, they are edible. And 3D printing and typography could be used in a practical application like this. From the top left, the stamp was printed with flexible material. An artist's book was made out of 3D printed PLA plastic. The ETH, uh, that's the type planner for basil, and no hate was printed uh, and installed across the campus as it could be installed in on a standard railing system and easily be removed or like moved to different places. These are type bracelets and rings. Uh, when they are printed with flexible material, they are safe, durable, and more importantly, they are wearable. Many designs could be homemade, I mean, to be printed at home. However, certain materials could be printed with a professional printing service. Uh, in my case, they are designed and sent to shapeways to be printed with stainless steel and bronze. The letter form looks aggressive and it is actually aggressive in reality. Now, I, as it's pretty sharp. I know uh, I poked my fingers several times. It's designed with Grasshopper. Grasshopper is a node-based parametric design tool which runs with Rhino. Rhino and Grasshoppers are widely used in educational and pro professional environments, architecture, jewelry, etc. Using the parameters, it allows designers to generate 3D design and type. This is a collaboration with Yohan An, an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. The type was originally designed with processing, then the letter form became 3D and printed with clay and glazed. These letter forms are designed with different seed fonts and beige shapes using Glasshopper. With 3D printing, these tools can bring can bring extended physical experiences in typography. It's one of the latest work. Bubble type was designed and printed with color PLA plastic. PLA is one of the most popular materials in 3D printing. I've been working with a San Francisco-based startup company called Lightform. With the projected AR devi device, I was able to scan the surface and add an additional layer to 3D printed type, simply make it lift. Bubble type was also exhibited through Type Force 11, an annual typography exhibition in Chicago. People were invited to touch the letters, especially children love to play with the, the bubble type. Yes, it was right before the pandemic. This is one of the, my student work from my advanced typography course. Students revisited their 2D modular type design assignment from the previous typography course. To redesign their modular type in 3D, 3D space, they were asked to reconstruct letter form with modules and reinterpreting shapes in three-dimensional space. The easiest way is extrude the letter form to add thicknesses but students were asked and encouraged to move further with various forms. A team of two students designed an 3D printed alphabet card from A to Z. The card offers uh, unique tactile experiences. For example, S is scary and the letter has goosebumps. They installed it in the library and invite people to write card by scratching the surface with crayon. My student designed a simple animation using processing. The printing print and then the print block was 3D printed with the wood filament. The final image was hand printed and it shows the progression of the word, the animation, uh, the progress of the word grow. This is the lean chair. LE is the chair and AN is the ottoman. The chair was made with CNC cut plywood. Even if it could go beyond typography, we use Microsoft Connect as a 3D scanner to scan students' body and digitally sculpt themselves. 
yeah, because of the global pandemic and shutdown, I had to stay at home and I was looking for some easy materials to work, like soap, candles, etc. Thankfully, I have a my have my garage studio and I have most of the tools I can use. It's a perfect time to work with soap. Uh, I started using 3D printing, casting, and typography. As I have experience with slick casting, mold making, and casting went well. It started as a fun side project and became a design project. After making various soap designs, I naturally thought about designing a package. It, it became a uh, my class assignment. Uh, a it became a class assignment for this semester. This is my student work from a junior graphic design studio. Uh, you can see a uh, diagram describe the processes. Uh, my students were able to experience the design process from the concept development and designing the product. And finally, they designed the package for their product. 3D letter form was designed using CAD. Uh, we used a uh, CAD software called the Tinkercad, one of the most easiest uh, CAD software. Then silicon mold were made with 3D printed letters. I demonstrated the soap making process in class while we are maintaining physical distancing. This is the final design. They have, uh, this is soap by the way. They have different themes such as fun, playful, scary, sci-fi, etc. The last step was designing unique packages for their soap, uh, for soap they designed. You can see a range of interesting ideas and designs. The other set of soap and the package design. My student already took typography one and two and graphic design one and two before taking the junior studio. With a strong design foundation, they were able to transfer their skills, knowledge, and talent to, their, to this project. It's boo bar, I know it's a challenging time, but we should do what you can do. Uh, washing your hands is an effective way and easy thing to do. And germs are scared of soap. 3D printing allows text to be printed material, materialized in the physical world using various materials. The tangible type amplified visual and physical interactions. It extends typography to perceptible typography with physical touch, which is one of the human senses. It suggests another linguistic experience beyond spoken, written, and visual languages. The design process accomplishes, accomplishes artistic expression, construction technique, and materiality. While exciting new digital technologies yield a strong influences, uh, integrating them into design education is a challenge. However, the demand for Well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Dehyum. Um, can I ask the panelists to start uh, getting on Zoom? Uh, as we're moving to the final conversation of the day, uh, the final talk, but I would like all the panelists to, to get on the Zoom link so we can have the panel after uh, Yehui uh typographic selfie and code. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Yeohyun An. Thank you for watching my presentation today. I'm an assistant professor of graphic design at the University of Wisconsin Medicine of the United States. I'd like to talk about typographic selfie plus code today. What is selfie? Selfie is a self-portrait digital photography that one has taken of oneself, typically one taken with a smartphone with camera and shared by social media. Over 1 million selfies are now taken every day. Selfies are not always as spontaneous as people seem. According to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a selfie is a form of art. 
It can be a communication tool, purposely. Typographic selfie plus code is an extension of a selfie plus code, which is a, ex a collection of generative selfies taken to raise awareness of Asian female faculty being isolated and marginal in a predominantly white institution of the United States. I was inspired by a research paper, Women of Color Faculty at the University of Michigan, Recruitment, Retention and Campus Climate, written by Amy Koch. Studies show that women faculty of color may be the most marginalized faculty on U.S. campuses. Challenging areas are isolation, high attrition, student evaluations, peer perception, additional service responsibilities. The visual style was inspired by Impressionism, which is a 19th century art movement that captured the moment. Like a woman with a parasol created by Cloud Monet, and Expressionism, expressing inner troubles and feelings of anxiety rather than technical skills or beauty that was a traditional goal of art. This is the screen created by Edward Mook. The computational processes expand the concepts of traditional self-portraits to generative selfies conveying specific thoughts or feelings. I use processing and mirror library developed by Dana Superman. It transforms each pixel from real-time video source to each rectangle on the levels of brightness by using an internal web camera. Each shape is transformed to each line to draw the moments being brushed off. Several variables, functions, and color palettes are added to express the visual theme. My internal web camera captured my self-portrait photography and eliminated the facial expression. And transformed my facial expression to express being brushed off. The series of the selfies were taken in my office space of a predominantly white institution to represent a space for Asian female faculty on U.S. campuses. The process was similar to professional photos taken in photo studio. It was taken by different angles and levels of the light, repeatedly and sequentially. It was invited to a distant mural or linear 3-minute motion graphic on a large-scale LED screen 50 foot feet by 6 feet at Media Arts Nexus at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. This is Selfie Plus Code version 1. It is a series of generative selfies to capture psychological moments to express that individual identities are devalued and deconstructed by homogeneous white institutions of the United States. It is from Selfie Plus Code version 3 with a subtitle Melancholy. It is a beginning of the typographic Selfie Plus Code research. I applied the typography into the Selfie Plus Code. Typographic Selfie Plus Code It is an extension of the Selfie Plus Code. According to Ellen Lupton, typography is what language looks like. Typography is the art of arranging letters and text in a way that makes the copy legible, clear, and visually appealing to the reader. Typography involves font style, appearance, and structure, which aims to elicit certain emotions and convey specific messages. Based on the type choices, different emotions and moods can be visually expressed through the generative surface. It is a visual research with diverse typefaces to embed visual expression into generative surface.
헬베티카 헬베티카 is a modern, intelligent and stylish typeface designed by Max Midinger in 1957. It is among the most widely used sans serif typefaces. Times New Roman Times New Roman is an intellectual, confidence, academic and professional typeface designed by Stanley Morrison in 1931. It was commissioned by the British newspaper, The Times. It is one of the most popular and influential typefaces in history and on desktop computers. Futura Futura is a modern, practical, comfortable, and capable sans serif typeface designed by Paul Renner in 1927. Didot Didot is a sophisticated, polished, and professional typeface developed in the period 1784-1811 by Didot family and redesigned by the Swiss typeface designer Adrian Fritigo. Baskerville. Baskerville is a traditional, credible, and neutral typeface designed by John Baskerville in 1750s in England. It is still popular in publication design. Zeppino. Zeppino is a calligraphic typeface designed for linotype by the type by the typeface designer Hermann Zepp in 1998. As a font, it makes extension use of ligatures and character variations. Esmelia Hari. Esmelia Hari is an elegant, calligraphic, script typeface designed by Arif to we at Cook Tech Kuning Studio in 2019. I used Korean typefaces like Nanum Myeongjo. Nanum Myeongjo regular is a Korean typeface. It is straightforward and clear. It is designed by Puntrix and published by Naver. Naver is a South Korean online platform. Nanum Godic. Nanum Godic regular is another Korean typeface. It is a rounded typeface. It is clean, sensitive, and modern. It is designed by Sandor Communications and Fontrix. Hangul. Hangul is a typeface designed by Taegyeong Lee who had a bilingual experiences between English and Korean. Also, he is another presenter at a p this year. His typeface Hangul used Korean vowels and constants to construct the English alphabet A to Z. It is an intercultural typography research and practice. Korean readers may think it is like a Korean, but it is an English typeface. The typeface Hangul is embedded into my generative selfie. Conclusion this research shows how to use typefaces in generative selfies to convey feelings and thoughts as extended typographic practices and application. It demonstrates traditional typographic principles and practices such as typeface choices and visual expression would be applicable and workable in generative selfies. The future research will involve more diverse typefaces aligning with the history and styles of Western and non-Western typefaces. 
also it will be more collaborative with the visual element to be visually more joyful and expressive and indicative. That's all I have today. Thank you for watching my presentation again. If you would be interested in learning about my project more, you would visit typeandcode.com, yohan.com, socialhomelessness.com. Thank you. Hello. Okay, hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, this is the, our end of day panel. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the, the session today and I'm receiving questions live. So if you want to send a last minute question, uh, you're more, more than welcome. I, I see all the social media here. Uh, also to the other panelists, you have received uh, the links in your email. So if you, you know, if, if you're okay, you can join yeah, us. Done. I would ask people for, for panelists to wear headphones or, you know, or, 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 or something like that. And we can start. We can start. So hello, everyone. Hi there. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Yeah. Hello. I hope you've enjoyed today's session and also congratulations to you for, for these fantastic presentations. Thank you. Yes, it was very inspirational and kudos to everybody for the brilliant, brilliant work and especially then to you as well, Lutheris, for everything you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your invitation. I'm so honored to present my project through Valencia Design Education Forum. It's a great event. Thank yes, you. yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. And Yehuin, you were also did a fantastic workshop last year at, at the first Alicante Design Workshop Forum. So yes. it was fantastic. Good. Yeah, during the, the time of pandemic, we can bring everyone from all over the world. So it's really great opportunity to learn more about others' work and also, you know, uh, no, we get to know each other as well. Absolutely. Thank you absolutely. for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So the, the main topic of the forum, which everyone has addressed beautifully, uh, is this relationship between analog and digital. Because it's almost like, uh, I mean, the, 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 the title came to me last year at the end of the, the last year's forum. But of course, <laughs> I had never realized last year that I would have to really explore it. So we kind of moved from a lot of analog to a lot of digital. Uh, and so can you just share your experiences of this year and uh, how you've um, how this has impacted you on your, on your teaching and learning? Uh, any, any, Who any, goes any, first? Any, any of you can start. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll go first if that's, if that's fine. Sure. Everybody. Um, yeah, so from my side, it, as with everybody, I think there, was, there were great challenges, um, especially in terms of thinking about how in terms of design specifically that was studio-based, we now take it forward to an online platform that I myself have experienced that you need to have the face-to-face. -face. You can't rely on technology alone. Yes, you can supplant some things in terms of theory or some certain modules, but the, the main problem with that is it will remain tacit knowledge. You will have to really engage with the students because I mean, we can all remember and still reflect on even last year when you have you know, a classroom environment or a studio environment, you can be as well prepared as you want, but the dialogues that remain and exist within a classroom and a studio, is that what sparks these additional informations and these additional conversations that really expand on the current knowledge and, and things that you are talking about in that specific time that now have become lost to some degree because you know, the technology predictates certain things that you have to do and it's very planned and then it cohorts certain things. So there's these limitations set and, and it reminds me again 
of what I have to do and what I had to do just to go back to almost the foundations and, and, and the principle sets. So from my side specifically, I mean, I deal a lot with um, illustration and, and character designing and, 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 and theory within it. And I had to then resort as well to creating an additional YouTube channel with additional you know, video material for students, but still, you know, the students go back and then and they reflect on it and they go, yes, this helps and this helps, but still there's attributes that still are lacking. And those lacking attributes are the things that they are actually doing by themselves that you see the moment they are doing, the actual hands-on process when you are there engaging that are lacking. So you've got this disconnect, even though you are connected with technology at the same time. So you're both online and offline, even though you think you are online type of thing. And, and that you know, that hinders the process. And I think you have to then really think back on what is it in the curriculum going multimodal that you restructure the things that you're actually doing. Mm -hmm. Because if we know it is hands-on, then, then how do we take the online platform and say, okay, mm -hmm. so how do we go hands-on? What are the things that we recreate the studio environment? To what extent do we recreate it? And to what extent do we not? Because we know certain things, I mean, from myself, I've got things that I've tried and tested and oh, some work, some don't because it's, it's a new era that we all went into. And I think, you know, the avenues of, of testing and experimentation really started to work greatly for me as well, because I could see certain technologies can work and certain things can't work. And you have to hone back into the livelihood of the students. I really thought very hard about the cohort of students that we have and what are their situations? Because not all of our students, for example, are connected. You can give them data, but the network coverage to some extent, you know, they, it doesn't reach them. So then they are left behind and you, and you need to not have students be left behind. So you need to do different interventions so that you cater for those that you know are slightly facing different um, stumbling blocks than others or different hurdles than others and at the same time there are those students who excel more fast than others and you can't have them sitting and you know twiddling their thumbs you have to again think of well how do you entice the the curriculum for them as well so from that realization at the end of the day, you, you come to realize that industry has shifted as well, not only just for us, but, but for the businesses out there where our students go into. And it has set the precedent for me in this time to realize at the same time, we've, we've always thought, you know, we need to hear and listen to what industry says. You know, what does industry say so that we can design or not design so that we can teach our students how to design for industry so that you know you can find your place in there but i really thought this process and thought to myself well we need to actually you know educate our students to reteach the industry to say to them you know what these are the things you don't have we we have our students but you don't have this so check what we have i fully i fully agree with you i mean industry i mean industry at the same time will want as i have seen many times will want one student designing one app completely including the programming the topography the the ux the everything so yeah there's one there's industry on the one hand and there's vision and ideals uh, idealism from another welcome amanda uh to the, to the panel. Hi, amanda. Uh, Hi. that was a fantastic uh, presentation we really enjoyed it thank you so much for your for the presentation uh, so the, just to, to reiterate, the question is about, we're talking about our experiences this year and about the online and offline, the analog and digital aspect of design education. And so uh, we're just talking about what happened this year and how we pivoted and how this has worked. Uh, so uh, who wants to go next? Maybe I can sure. talk about a little bit my based on my experience and also like some thoughts about uh, the current situation and analog and digital. It's not something like we can choose one over another. It's kind of, we, if we go to analog, we are missing some digital. Mm -hmm. And we, if we move to digital, we are missing some analog touch. So always we go, go back and forth between two things. You know, For example, I think because of that, the balance is pretty impor really important thing. You know, th like this conference, you know, we can all attend at Zoom. At home, you know, we can just listen to everything, YouTube, but you know, we are missing some kind of, you know, the experience, you know, in-person experience with everyone. So if we go to digital, uh, you know, in-person next year, hopefully, 
you know, we will miss some of these elements. So we will need always miss the the other parts. So I think the balance is a really important thing. Mm -hmm. So like, just don't try not to lean toward or just believe in one thing. Also, the other thing is, uh, especially the last semester, the spring semester and this semester, uh, I think the accessibility is a big keyword because, you know, everything is, many things accessible, like this lecture, video, resources, everything. But uh, sometimes that's not just enough too, because there are so much resources out there, but, you know, someone can serve you the food, but you should feed yourself. Other than that, it's not really useful. So like, and sometimes, you know, we send our student, here's a link, here's a video, here's an email, but like the other talk, you know, sometimes they don't really like check email or read email well. So uh, it's kind of the challenge how we can encourage our student to, to engage with this experience because sometimes, you know, they stuck at home or they also need to work and they have their own life as well. So like that was kind of particularly a challenge, but I've seen some students thrive in this situation as well. But I think one uh, thing could be kind of resourcefulness, you know, like it is what it is. So what we have and what we're gonna do, sometimes uh, often students like think proactively, like think about like what they're gonna do and other stuff, you know, so, it's kind of uh, like it's kind of weird time, but you know, at least uh, we are artists and designers, and we are creative professionals. So we are trying to solve the problem, and I'm excited to learn more about how they are doing because we all find a different solutions or a way to work with this, and that will really help uh, all educators to prepare for the next semester. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, also, just one other thing is, uh, you know, in the past, like, like many graphic design courses, you need to print a lot, mm -hmm. but because of the uh, pandemic, we cannot really do much. So I've noticed that like many assignments go to digital, like a screen based, or like just make a mock-up, or even use the uh, website. So you just send PDF, and they're gonna print the book, bound it, and send back. Just if you can tolerate the uh, turnout, you know, about two weeks, you can just send the design, receive it like contactless. So like, uh, I think those resources hopefully will uh, remain there and then we can incorporate those for our education mm -hmm. and our, for our student as well. Fantastic, mm -hmm. fantastic. I mean, you're talking about the learning styles that are suiting every, everyone, but at the same time, we need to ensure that they understand that this is a dedication. You know, as I say it many times, uh, visual communication graphics is the is the hard way out. <laughs> it's not the easy way out. And mm -hmm. I, uh, having been teaching for many years visual communication design, which is quite mm -hmm. broad and open minded, mm -hmm. uh, I get students coming because they think, okay, this is viscom, you know, okay, mm -hmm. this is easy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's not. <laughs> so yep. it, it it's quite hard these days to communicate the kind of dedication that's required by so actually, our, by our courses, yeah. and in a way. Uh, Zoom does not encourage mm -hmm. that kind of dedication, but anyway, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah. So thank you, Taekyung. And mm -hmm. I mean, my experience from in-person class to virtual class setting, at the beginning, I really struggled to make a transition, but I'm quite positive experience that because I teach UI UX, web design, creative coding, technically, it is possible to teach virtually. But for instance, I had a meeting, in-person meeting with my student yesterday that it took almost two weeks virtually by using Zoom to do discussing, finalizing ideas for in in-person meeting setting. It took just 30 minutes to figure out what's the problem of your design process and what is the direction we have to go. So in-person class is more efficiently, we can communicate with the student. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the meeting, student was very impressed, impressed and surprised that the meeting was ended so quickly, just took less than 20 minutes. And then they were, wow. And they said, so I said, yeah, that's why we need in-person class. 
absolutely. <laughs> so anyway, also, I'm a graphic design educator that in this situation, I really care about how to foster virtual supporting system in graphic, ed graphic design education. So I try to encourage my students that you have to support each other uh, to survive during this uncertainty mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. a graphic designer. So I really try to focus on how you can create supporting system for graphic design. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amanda? So um, I have a, hi, hi, Hello. sorry. Um, I have a, a bit of a different experience mm -hmm. in, in my um, teaching online education. I've been teaching online for about 10 years, <clears throat> but I primarily teach um, history and theory classes, which are classes that do lend themselves really well to online instruction. <clears throat> so I've been teaching about half of my classes online and half of my classes face to face so that we offer a little bit of variety for our students um, for enrollment options. <clears throat> and then when we went online, uh, transitioning all my classes online was not a big deal for me. Um, but I will say it has been a very big deal for my co-faculty who do primarily teach studio courses and they run into the same issues that you all are describing. Um, I have to say there is a part of me that loves that they were sort of forced into this experience because I have been teaching online for 10 years. And even though I teach history and theory courses, I run into the exact same issues that you were just mentioning where giving feedback and, and trying to diagnose problems and issues with students online takes a tremendous amount of time and energy. It's exhausting. And I've run into this problem where, um, you know, some of the administration has been trying to pack people into my classes where there's this idea that you, it's online, there's unlimited seats. We can pack as many as you want. Um, and I've been really fighting that. And so I, I really am, like I said, I'm, I'm really kind of glad that, that my co-faculty were sort of forced into that so that they understand where I'm coming from when I keep telling them, you can't just load me down with students. Uh, you know, it, it really interrupts the quality of the feedback and the time that I'm able to give to those students. Um, but yes, a lot of my co-faculty have run into the exact same issues with online instruction in the classroom. Um, students don't participate as well online. Um, they don't give us thorough feedback as you want during critiques and, and you know, sessions like that, idea generating sessions. Um, and one issue that I've run into is Zoom. All of my classes that were would have been face to face or on Zoom. And um, I try to respect their privacy by not forcing them to turn on their cameras. Um, but I do request that they turn on their cameras. And I'm very much finding that I'm making it's hard to make connections with a student in an online setting, no matter what, mm -hmm. but I am making better connections with the students who do turn on their cameras. Um, and, and I'm still stuck with that. Like mm -hmm. I want mm -hmm. to make connections with all of the students, but I want to respect their privacy and, you know, and some of them don't have the bandwidth to turn on their cameras all the time. So I want to respect that as well. Um, so I'm real sh still struggling with that. I want to make those connections. I mean, that's why I got into education. I'm sure that's why all of us did. We want to help students. We Absolutely. want to make connections. Absolutely. That's perfectly valid. Hello, Pete. Welcome. Hey, uh, thank you. Hello. We're discussing about our, our path this year and our challenges on, on going from analog into digital, on going... And we were just uh, telling our stories. Hello, Rosina. Welcome as well. So yeah, I think I wanted to um, share a little bit too on my experience with Zoom and my requirements, which are different than Mandy's. Um, and I make that part of my attendance and participation that their video is on. And I've even made it part of my attendance and participation that they are not in pajamas that they are not laying in bed covered with a blanket. And I've even explained to them, you know, you're in a fortunate, a very fortunate situation that you have the advantage to just walk into a different room and attend class. 
rather than have to you know, drive all the way into campus for those that commute, find a place to park, work your way up to the classroom and be there on time. So if they can't be professionally prepared for class in just a different room in their house, um, that's not a good professional practice is, and, and I believe that's what we're doing in the universities is, is getting them into that professional practice. Um, they are absent from class and I've uh, just gone through midterm grades. And I think a lot of students are going to be surprised when their participation grade is very low, if not, you know, at a failing grade for attendance and participation, just due to that lack of preparation for, for class meetings, whether they're Zoom or online, says the guy who's late to the panel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just got the email the other day about, about it's how the precise attendance from, from Zoom is quite it's quite interesting. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I agree with Peter that definitely I have a class manner in my syllabi that at the beginning I have a mutual agreement with my student that I keep the class hour from the beginning to end every section was I request my son already video camera on during class hours. Mm -hmm. Also, I, in my class manner uh, section, I clearly only mention about clean up your background mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. always put your face straight away. And some son may try to say leaning on like this. So yeah, definitely I agree with Peter that we need a mutual agreement at the beginning. Absolutely. Hello, Rosina. How are you? Welcome. Can you hear Hi, us? well, Fantastic. yes, I can Fantastic. hear you. And Fantastic. Thank you. I'm obviously not the only one that was late, so that was good to no hear. Don't worry. <laughs> we had our first question, and we are uh, talking about our experiences this year from uh, uh, pivoting from analog to digital into more digital environments of teaching and learning. So, mm -hmm. uh, is there something you'd like to say about the experience uh, of, of this? Well, for me, I've always um, done the hybrid because I work for myself. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been really a lot of contact on the digital spectrum. Um, of course, the, you know, missing out on a lot of the conferences and, and, and everything and that human interaction that, that I had also. But in terms of the education of what I've seen, certainly with having three children, um, there's been a big difference between teachers and educators who were very confident with actually the digital spectrum and who kind of straight away jumped into it compared to the ones that were totally afraid of it. So that whole kind of digital transformation that we've been, I guess that governments have been talking about investing in over the years, well, boy, did we really see where the gaps were. And I think also that whole um, gap in terms of for the vulnerable. You know, I also have a child, which I spoke about, obviously, in the video that I did earlier on, um, on your session, mm -hmm. uh, who's special needs. And so there also, you know, there's been a huge gap, of course, of um, youth that don't have access to that digital education, that don't have the access to the computers. And if families have, you know, two or three kids, not every single one has a computer and the Absolutely. parents also Absolutely. working from home. So, I mean, you need then five computers, you know, at home if you've got a family of five or a family of, of four. And even with us being in a luxury situation of having digital access, but having three children, it meant that each one needed that, that access. So I think there were so many different interesting observations that came out. And we've seen some great initiatives from community coming together where they were raising funds and contact, contacting corporates to um, get, oops, sorry, to get old computers and to um, really help on, on social causes to, you know, try and bridge that gap. Absolutely. So I have a lot of passionate thoughts about that, you know, and I think mm -hmm. governments and institutions need to do so much more to bridge mm -hmm. that divide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, the, the, the another another thing I've been thinking about is that uh, having participated over this year in many national and international dialogues about uh, about pivoting, um, the, the the discussions are very rarely from a student uh, from a student perspective. So it, it seems, especially from an administration point of view, it seems that the student is is absent on all the decision making. 
So how can we, um, how can we get the discussion to be more student-centered rather than than less? We need to ask them. We need to reach out. We need to get that feedback from them. You know, I think we need to be communicating and having feedback from educators and our students together, perhaps. Yeah, but for example, you have you have now you have uh, certain countries uh, insisting that all studios are uh, physical. Yeah, and so they, they, there's the safeguarding design in many ways. They say, look, design is done one to one physical process. If it will take all the precautions and we'll look after the student because we'll explain to the student that design is done uh, on on a one to one on one to one. It's not taught via Zoom. Other 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 universities and countries are either by force or by choice moving to to completely one hundred percent online. But in all these processes, usually the student is not present. They're not. So, uh, who wants to take the question? Sort of again. <coughs> I think, oh. um, if I may, I'll just kind of start. I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer the question, but I want to put more into the thought process of what we need to consider. Um, our university, for example, is uh, we, when we come to the design classes, we definitely focus more on um, process and theory and methodology to a certain degree. And I, and I think it's it's being able to separate those because there's some universities where they have very specific classes that might be based around here's some software here's how we use the software here's what we build with the software knowing your design principles and your design um, uh, ideas or whatever it might be here's what we build with software so it's very functional practical kind of based classroom teaching. And I think that can lend itself well to online, but then the problem becomes, are students actually using the software? Uh, so for example, um, I have a intro class where we are talking about methodology and process, and we do some demonstration, very little demonstration because we're not there to teach software, we're there to teach theory, methodology, uh, and design process. Mm -hmm. um, in we show some software, but then when it comes to, now we're doing a hybrid, so we have online and in-person classes. When the students show up into the in-person classes, nothing has been done. And they haven't even used the software to practice the demonstration that's happened. So my more successful classes are purely the theory-based classes where it's mostly design thinking, um, design methodologies, putting, putting things in practice into planning, strategy, organization, and not the execution part. And then those students are doing really well because they understand, well, I have to build outside the classroom. So I, I think the models, that, I think there's a variety of models in design teaching. And I think that's where the inconsistency or lack of clarity as to how we need to execute this. Because as, um, as Rosina was saying, some are ready to just jump into that digital world. And like, yeah, we can totally do that. Because I think that course is really set up for that opportunity. Even Amanda, um, who's been teaching online, um, she's gone through the trials and turmoils of what's working, what's not working. Um, so that, that pivot almost becomes second nature where, where those that have never really been in, in an online atmosphere, whether learning on their own or teaching, um, you know, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult to understand the transition to do so. I've been fortunate enough where I had a lot of online learning and a good amount of online teaching. So I was kind of in the middle and even what I thought was going to work really well and what was easy to execute ended up not working. And it's something that I've done before at a different university with different students in a different region of the United States and it worked really well. So I also think it, it's so tied to our particular student body and their demographics and 
where they're coming from and what their experiences are. And it's, it's really hard. I think each university does have to make their own decisions. Mm. But left areas, as you're saying, we need the student voice mm. to know it's not working. Because so many of my students are like, we're so confused. Yeah. Because in your class, you're doing A. In my other class, we're doing B. They've got five classes and everyone's doing something different. So there's no, no formal understanding or consistency that they need to follow. Absolutely. That's, that's very important. Can I can I comment on that? Please, sure, sure. Um, yeah, Peter, I, I fully agree um, with what you're saying, and we have faced the same, you know, type of situation from our students. I think what's what happened with our students as well is that what we mentioned earlier is we try to support them in many instances as possible in terms of data and you know having them be connected, but some just don't have network coverage, even if you give them as much data as you possibly can. So what we had to resource on as well is to set up not only you know, devices for them um, in terms of iPads and additional third party apps that in, you know, with the whole fee structure was feasible, but at the same time with what you mentioned about you know, the uncertainty with students is we, we set up, for example, an ERT type of briefing manual basically just, you know, setting up a manual so that the students can see, you know, doing almost like a collaborative um, project base between different modules, um, saying that so from the one module, they've got deliverables on the one thing, on the one thing and the other, and they speak to one another, but at the same time, they can see what are the consultation times between one lecturer and another, so that that confusion starts to be, you know, you know put aside so that they know exactly these are my consultation times and this is what I'm doing for one module and it's not for nothing because that's also what sometimes came, came out is that students think, okay, so why am I doing this in terms of what I'm doing with other things? And then there's this weird uncertainty as what you also speak about. And then, you know, you're like, okay, but this is the reason they go, yeah, I know, but <laughs> why exactly? And then you go, okay, this is the reason. And then, okay, they need to see it, you know, like on black and white on paper to go, okay, this is what I need to do. This is what my outcomes are. This is what I'm going to get assessed on. And, and that process of actually giving them a manual and say, listen, here's your remote manual that you're going to work on. And then you know what you're going to do remotely. And, you know, when you are on campus is something that worked. But at the same time, you had to almost set it up to such an extent that you have a lot of leeway because you, you don't know what's going to happen. Will campus close? Will it open again? So that... You know, you can't plan and say, okay, we'll be back, you know, everybody next week, we're in class, all thumbs up. And then, oh, wait, we can't go back. And then it's a screw up because then what are you going to do? So you need to, you know, factor in so many additional things. Mm -hmm. And as you rightly say as well, that the process was more so in line to idealization and, and conceptualizing and thinking about the problem and delving into that in terms of, you know, cognitive development, soft skills, looking at, you know, how can you unpack the scenario and then when you've got the resources yes then you start to implement to a greater degree and that again is again where the problem comes in because you can't just have the student just rely on you know just the theory components and the idealization they have to do the physical things and that's where we said we've got this catch-22 at, at the end of the day as well but there is a great need for both but i think that we have to think about you know how do we restructure this for 2021 2022 the curriculum to say, so how do we cater for both? So that if there's an issue, we know we can jump back to point A or B, and we know we can facilitate and aid the student so that there isn't a lack of knowledge gain or skill gain. I think I've noticed, um, in, uh, I wanna know if anyone else has had a similar problem, that what I wanted to accomplish in this semester is probably three weeks, if not more, kind of behind schedules where I wanted it to be. And it's mostly, and it's not, it's not due to me not delivering material. It's to me that I have to hold off because the students aren't progressing in a manner that should be acceptable. And I'm really at kind of a, um, a crossroads of of what decision to make on that and how to move forward. And it is unfortunate that I think our students are 
I don't think they're getting a lesser education because of the situation we're in, but I think they're, I think they're taking in a lesser education. So there's definitely a big problem there. Absolutely, because, because the experience is, is lacking. Exactly. On, on a yeah. physical studio, we're creating an experience. Uh, our teaching is not information. In fact, it's everything but information. And, mm -hmm. and, and this thing right now is really uh, uh, transmitting information. Well, how much of, how much of the, the onus is on the students of applying themselves to it? So an online Zoom meeting that's two hours and 40 minutes long is absolutely insane. So even though my studio classes are two hours and 40 minutes, I will only run a 50 to 60, sometimes um, an hour and 10 minutes max Zoom meeting. Mm. And I don't know how many times after the Zoom meetings I have brought up the fact of like, okay, you still have an hour's worth of class because you are scheduled in that time slot where if you were on campus, please use your time wisely. And I, I definitely can understand from what's coming into the classroom that perhaps they're, they're not, perhaps it's coffee time, nap time, play with the cat or something like that. And, um, you know, I'd like to think greater um, opportunities from students. Uh, however, it is that disconnect of that not being in the physical presence and going through that experience. And you've mentally set that time apart and you have student colleagues there that are working with you that entire time mm. where when a Zoom meeting is over, you're alone again. And then how do you how do you continue that communication or that that learning process in your mind? Absolutely. Yeah. So let me share my online teaching experience that again okay, compared with Amanda that I started teaching online this year, this spring. That anyway, uh, good news is that I use virtual office hour. I set up my virtual office hour at calendarly.com. Whenever they may want, they can sign up automatically. Whenever they sign up, it would calendarly. I do, I'm not promoting calendarly.com, but I mean, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm using all kind of existing platform to make uh, my students connect uh, with me. That so that is a one part way also. Uh, go back to your initial question, how we would teach student-centered, how, how we would offer student-centered education. Again, it takes time a lot, but individually, I care for e each student to have their own critical thinking mm -hmm. as a designer, rather than providing a uh, direct direction, like a change the color. Absolutely. What, what do you think about that? Absolutely. Why you use this color scheme? What's the purpose? What's the goal? That it really take time if I care each student to foster their critical thinking as a designer. Also, I try to inject, I don't want to use expression inject, but I try to educate each student in graphic design to have their own vision mm. as a designer. Vision, leadership, responsibility to the society as a designer. It really takes time. And, but that is my just a primary teaching philosophy beyond by using Zoom or in-person way. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, oh, can I just add something? Also, I do believe that we can't underestimate the impact of this period on our students. And so indeed that whole kind of lack of human connection. And I've noticed also the difference it makes when there's an educator who will also ask the children or the youth or the older students, how they feel, how are they? Reaching out also on a human level. During, um, I think it was during the Easter holidays, we still had a lockdown here and one of my son's um, educators actually dropped by with social distancing on a bike to each of his 14 students around Brussels just to hand a personal note. Now, I'm not saying that's what every educator has to do, but he also left videos for them recorded of just talking about what a challenging time this was. If they need anything, they're there for them. 
and just don't don't be too hard on yourself you know really this kind of emotional intelligence tapping into that and I think that made a huge difference compared to one who was maybe it was just coming in doing the class going so I think this kind of connection we can still try and create um on a digital level and it still I think resonates and it's still very much what's needed during this time don't know what your thoughts you, are you've highlighted one, one of the well, a very important point uh, mm -hmm. is that we cannot have the same expectations and that's and that's you know all, all of the students during this period so and that's something I think all of us are are building into our teaching but uh, this is your your problem Oh. I agree with you. Yes. Take them. Yes. Oh, I just like to add something, you know, like when like spring semester, we when we suddenly switched to online, like the expectation was okay, like we're gonna use a Zoom so they can student our student can see us and listen to us and so they can learn. But like I'm sure you all agree with that somehow, like that's not how we teach and learn because you know we are using the vision and hearing but actually when you walk into the classroom like Pete said like you take a shower dress up walk or drive to you know classroom which means you are get prepared yourself and like an immersive and have an immersive experience there it's not just kind of listen to that hearing that like it, the learning and teaching happens with some sort of in the environment and also involve with some kind of muscle memory as well especially the design education without like doing it like it's not really it makes sense because for example like cooking video when you see the cooking video it's magically done and then like feels like you can do that but you know that's not a true like just giving the recipe is not the right thing and also when you have the although you know how to use the recipe after that you can like tweak it and customize it and like uh, you know make your own recipe based on that like i think that's what students should do Brilliant. so like we may need some kind of for learning and teaching. Like we are not just like, for, for example, one thing is I'm teaching my class as a hybrid. So I see my students at least once a week, but they all wearing the masks and I have really hard time reading their faces. Like, and then, but I try my all the senses to read their emotions. So like, I'm, you know, almost developing a sixth sense or something, you know? <laughs> But like a Zoom or something as well, like we are like what Amanda said, like we are using our old senses to pay attention to like their facial emotion in Zoom or how they dress. We are kind of really trying hard. But interesting thing is in classroom, we, we naturally get that right away. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I don't know how to describe it, but I, I believe we all agree with that, you know, that we have some other senses to Absolutely. sensing Absolutely. the emotion there. And students would, might have the same thing too. Yeah, so. I would fully agree with that. And I didn't realize that until you said that, that I haven't had that emotion or experience at all this semester uh, with in hybrid online and in class. So I haven't had that in class moment with them where I've been teaching this is my 12th year teaching. And I can think of numerous times where you just sense it. You just know you have to like ask some questions, find out what they're thinking. And you, you know they need more, but they don't wanna ask or inquire on it, or they need a little guidance. So I know, I know exactly what you're referring to. Uh, and that's definitely missing this, this semester. And it, it a lot might have to do with the, the face coverings. It might have to do with when we do have a moment to be in the classroom, we're trying to get them to execute more than we're trying to deliver theory uh, content. Um, but that's a really good point, for sure. Amanda, have you got something to, to add to this conversation? Well, I just, I want to speak a little bit more to, <clears throat> excuse me, getting feedback from students. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that that is certainly very important, and they do need to be brought into the conversation. And it is hard to figure out exactly how to bring them in and when to bring them in. Um, but I, I've, I think we can be strategic about it. Um, and like, a, for example, 
I really emphasized last spring how important my evaluations were for them. And I was going to go over them thoroughly and look for any feedback about this because we were pretty sure we were going to be doing that in the fall. Um, and one of the, you know, just an example, one of the things that they mentioned was that I spoke too quickly. Um, so, you know, I really, I really tried to pay attention to that and work on that. I also, they requested more, I always give my students a break, even in the classroom, um, but they requested more shorter breaks instead of one long break. Um, and so I, I worked that in as well. Um, I just also an idea on, um, on how to, uh, you know, make those connections uh, in a, maybe a studio class and getting the feedback like, you know, um, you know, the, the crit critique and the answers and response of why did you choose that color? What were you thinking? And that sort of thing is, um, you know, Pete had said that he doesn't make them stay in Zoom for two hours and 40 minutes or whatever, um, but maybe, maybe we use some of that class time to have either individual sessions with students um, to make sure that they do get some of that either one-on-one -on -one feedback or maybe we make smaller cohorts, um, you know, groups of, of three or four where we uh, really dig into the meat of, of the assignment or the project that they're working on with them um, and set up time schedules using the calendar.com or, or, or whatever. <laughs> Um, just some thoughts. Yeah, I yeah, definitely. I use my class hour fully to provide lecture, workshop demo, also group critique, one to discussion intensively. Yes, I invite each student to break out room mm -hmm. to provide uh, each individual approach. Definitely, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree with uh, Amanda. Yes. Yeah, I I too have utilized the breakout rooms um, after my my lecture time. And I have found that to be beneficial, uh, for sure. Another thing that I've done in, um, I, I think that I'm going to now with our conversation is have one at the end of the semester, but I always have in the beginning of the semester, I use Google Forms mm -hmm. and I've created my own questions from my heart and my mind to my students in preparation for the semester to kind of get a sense of where everybody's at They've even been questions as to how's your internet connection? What computer do you have at your disposal? How familiar are you with using online meeting tools? What's your favorite platform? Facebook, FaceTime, uh, Google Meet, or whatever those might be. Uh, and I've asked those personal questions as to how are you doing um, with everything? Are you doing well? Is your family doing well? Um, in through this conversation, I do believe that now I'm going to possibly even have a midterm one, but definitely have an end of semester um, feedback and ask those questions like, what could we do differently? So I'll collect them personally, but I think maybe it would be a good idea for our departments to have conversations from all our faculty say, let's, let's gather this information from all of our classes and let's compile it it doesn't matter if we all use the same questions. I think we can use varying questions without a problem um, and go ahead and then kind of analyze that at the end of the semester during that like final faculty meeting and then make some um, addressing changes. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps even the chairs or the heads of our departments can take those to the college level and to the university level. So that might be as Lefteris is asking, like how do we you know how do we manage this but maybe that's a place to start you know uh it always has to start with the individual and um become a collective so i think that's what i'm going to do personally is um introduce some new uh google forms that can collect some data and then see if our department's willing to participate in at least an end of semester uh, version because we we all know that we'll be back in this scenario for spring um and we all hope that by next fall of, of 2021 that we're beyond this moment. But I also know that uh, um, from a conversation that I've had um, with my colleague, we're gonna be continuing some of the ways that we teach and learn now. Um, and we're gonna have more opportunity to do student meetings via um, these opportunities where they are online Zoom opportunities rather than you know meeting in the office like a student can't get to campus or something for some reason. It's like this is a great idea where we can still have these 
advising meetings or other meetings um, via the technology. So the technology now may have not been there before, but I think going forward, it's going to be part of our, our everyday um, mm -hmm. way we operate. Fantastic. I, mean, I can also just comment on, on possibly just on what Peter said and also on what uh, Rosina said and Amanda earlier is one of the things that also worked for us to a great extent as well as just to connect on the human level first it was also to structure like two to three sessions in a week just with students bodies and just talk to them just have we call it just like a chat time so that those who want to log in log in and you hear you know how's it going what are the struggles connectivity issues personal issues whatever the case might be and then with you know those lectures also like amanda said and you also said you know the students have a very small attention span so you know you do these little bursts of classes and you know content driven stuff and then what also then worked is to say okay well you know what, now I've got 10 minutes to do, you know, your own reflection about, you know, one another's work. So do like a peer review session and, you know, then you sit back and then they go, okay, cool. Now they've got ownership. So the moment when they almost got again ownership of saying, you know, I've got this online means, I can now give a voice, you know, they, they take it and they grasp it to a full extent, which, which aided them greatly in terms of their own development and thinking process without just doing, but thinking about it. And, you know, coming back to that human component and then, you know, giving feedback is the moment you really, you know, embark on asking them, listen, what are the struggles, irrespective just of, you know, the class situation environment, but what are the things you're struggling with? And rightly, as you said, you know, with the Google Forms as well, we've realized that, you know, we've given, you know, many attributes um, and platforms for students to work on and say, okay, these are the things that you can work on from a PC to this, to these devices and platforms. And then we realized that there's a lack of communication on various things. So where was it that the students find, you know, a pleasure or comfort in working on? And ironically is most of them like to use WhatsApp. In our situation, that's what they wanted to use. So that you realize, okay, so all the other stuff is there, but Right, fine, if you want to use WhatsApp, so let's, let's use it. So then we restructured again our communication channels, feedback channels again to that platform. But it was very necessary um, because if we didn't ask, we didn't you know, inquire about it, we would have been you know, none the wiser. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so is there any aspect of, of today that you, anybody would like to discuss uh, in particular? Uh, so we can sort of have an open conversation about uh, today's event and the sessions and uh, each other's presentations or other people, other people's presentations. I've been, I've been enjoying watching them. I thought the keynote was a great uh, a great start, and I liked um, the discussion about the um, practice to practitioner uh, moment of. of of what he was speaking to. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I found um, I found that as well. I think the keynote was very nicely structured in terms of, you know, as I've mentioned, that ORM, that that loop of, of working processes. But at the same time, when I listen to all the other, other talks, it's, you know, it's not only inspiration, but it's also it gives you an excitement of wanting to collaborate. Um, I commented on on Pete and, and Amanda. I, I've commented on you know how great a project that is, and and that the scope can can just branch out far more than you know what you're currently working on. So I'll wait that you, you publish that you, that you do it in 2022, and then when you've got everything done, then we can do another one in a shorter time. Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, I yes, <laughs> I agree with that. I think that project has a great potential as a multidisciplinary project beyond. The, documentary feeling that I think graphic design community and other community would be very welcome to collaborate with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've, Mandy and I have had many conversations about um, the, the opportunity that this has in understanding that, you know, a full, a full length feature documentary film of about an hour and 20 minutes or an hour and 40 minutes doesn't give you much window to really cover this in the depth that it needs to be covered. Mm -hmm. Um, it, even if it, we talk about diversity and race and uh, economic standings, whether it's um, in, in Europe, in Asia, in India, or 
wherever it might be in the world and, and what that looks like and how different that would vary across the globe. So yeah, Mandy and I've had like, wow, there's so much to talk about here. You know, how do we find that little moment where we can talk about this in a, in a short documentary film and the opportunity for, for growth on it is, is an expansion. We've even talked about a series. Yeah, so, um, so awesome. we're talking about Netflix series. <laughs> I was saying that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fantastic. Well, thank you all, I appreciate fantastic. it. Yeah. Because, yeah, let me just share yeah. that I'm working with a multidisciplinary project, social homelessness on U.S. campuses. That I think it also relates with your documentary film, like social homelessness of female in design area historically. That because initially my multidisciplinary project, social homelessness on U.S. campuses, was inspired by a documentary film to bring awareness of a diversity issue on campuses that I extended that project to Corella projection, site specific installation, mobile application, social gathering. I think your project has a huge potential. I would be welcome to talk more about this project with your team, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. Feel free to reach out send an email we'll, we'll talk more for sure anyone yes. that's interested yeah thank you i will yeah anyone else would like to say something about just as a general comment you're okay i can say just generally yeah. really mm -hmm. enjoyed it uh, mm -hmm. lifting really fantastic. enjoyed it the keynote was fantastic and then uh, thoroughly enjoyed it and well, also it's all because of you it's all because of, of you, you. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. Well, we are already preparing for Monday. We'll be preparing for uh, Design Education Forum 2021. So again, ideas and suggestions to make this even even, even bigger and better uh, is uh, welcome. And we're back in less than 15 hours. So I, I do apologize for the US time, but I try to create uh, two sessions like US and Europe, roughly. Uh, but every presentation, even this this uh, panel, will be available on YouTube uh, from Friday night. So all the presentations, all the speeches, everything you saw today, will be there. It'll be uh, it'll be unlocked. It'll be unlocked. And uh, thank you so much for coming. And, thank, uh, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Fantastic, fantastic thank conference. you. Thank and you. And thank you to everybody. Thank, thank you. you. It was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care.